Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Rivera, and I'm the Director of the Community Health Improvement with John Muir Health. And I am also a proud member of a board member of the Family Justice Center. Hello, and welcome to the Building Safety Through Community Fundraiser. We are here today to celebrate the Family Justice Center's 10th anniversary. Yes, you heard me right, the 10th anniversary. And as you saw in the video, tribute. In 2011, the Family Justice Center started as a pilot project running out of the Richmond Police substation at the Hilltop Mall one day a week. Look at how the center has grown in the last 10 years, and we are so proud of the work that we have done in Contra Costa County. We are proud to have three centers throughout Contra Costa County serving survivors of interpersonal violence. Yes, three one in West Contra Costa, Central Costa Contra Costa, and now in East Contra Costa. This past year has been challenging for everyone, but especially for the clients of the Family Justice Center, as their homes were not safe to shelter in place. The center has remained physically safe as a, as a place for clients to come and to get the resources they need. In 2020, during the pandemic, the center assisted over 4,400 individuals experience abuse and violence in their home. And today we want to celebrate our 10th anniversary in a joyous way through music and art. And this year's music and art festival will bring the community together and inspire hope. We sure do need it after this year. I also wanna add a personal line and a personal dedication to a very close cousin of mine who was a victim of interpersonal violence and she suffered for years in silence and unfortunately lost her life at the end of December, of uh, the end of 2020, unbeknownst to her entire family of cousins and aunts and uncles and um, mother, grandmothers, um, we did not know that she was a victim of interpersonal violence. And only when she left her four biological children and four other adopted children were we privy to the secrets that she lived through. And in honor of her today, I ask each and every one of you to join me today in this journey to be able to honor all of our survivors and all of those who continue to live in silence as we discovered through writings that she had, photographs that she took and evidence that she presented that her life wasn't what we all thought it was. So this is not to be silent anymore. And I am so proud to be her voice today. And I urge each and every one of you to know that it can happen to anyone anywhere, anytime, in any type of setting. So I'm so glad that we have such a community here today. And yes, it's emotional. And yes, I am speaking from the heart and I'm just so honored to share her story in honor of her life that she lost at 46 years of age. I do wanna take a moment now to thank all of our sponsors. And we could not do this work without their support. We'll recognize their partnerships throughout the event. And there are four levels of sponsorships. The top level is the Hope Circle. And this is for sponsors who are able and thankfully able to provide sponsorships for those like my cousin and for the 4,400 victims in Contra Costa County. They're followed by the Healing Circle, the Safety Circle and Friends. And as you can tell, with the naming of these sponsorships, it's really about the support and the community and the way that we hold up those who need our help, even by the naming of the circles. And in addition to our sponsors, we all on behalf of the board and the staff at the Family Justice Center, we wanna thank you for being here today and celebrating our work with us. When I think of my cousin and I think of all those who have under, un, endeared such difficult circumstances, at the end, there's a tunnel. At the end of that tunnel, there is light at the end of that tunnel. And we are so glad to be part of their journey. And we welcome you today to be part of our journey 
and we welcome you into our circle of caring for those who are in domestic violence and interpersonal violence situations. Our program today is a little different, but it will feature our family justice supporters who will share why they support the family justice and you'll get to hear from former clients who will share how they benefited from our work. We also want to showcase the, the artwork. It's very special, submitted by our local artists. The theme for their work was hope. Our theme today is hope. And even though someone like my cousin has lost her life, there is hope. Hope in the children they left behind, the advocates, my, my cousin who called me as they were leaving home after being threatened after her death, they had hope in their voice. And that gives me hope. And I'm so proud that we are here to provide hope to our community. When we asked our artists to participate, we asked them to think about what does hope feel or look like? What's interesting is sometimes it's hard to put together what is hope and how do we think about it or how do we put it on paper? And today, I think we're going to see a great way that people were able to describe hope in their artwork. I wanted to share with you that I purposely have not seen any of the artwork because I, too, want to go on this journey with you today. And I, too, want to be inspired at the same time that you are. Or to see this hope. We were also going to bring music to part of this hope, to bring a lot of this alive. And I think you will be, in, you will just enjoy it, feel it, and understand the heartfelt hope and caring that came into this uh, music. We do have two live performances by Maria Jose Montejillo. And before we start the Art and Music Festival, we want to share this testimony from Gloria. Thank you Hi, all. Hi, my name is Gloria. I want to start off by thanking God for protecting my son and I and getting us to safe grounds. I am beyond grateful to be here. Wish I could be, be there in person. I'm the second child out of four children. I come from a family who struggles with alcoholism and addiction. Both of my parents eventually went into recovery treatment to try to make a better life for themselves and their children. I, on the other hand, never received the help or support I needed to move forward in life, to make wise choices as I got older. Since I lived in a life of abuse, it seemed to follow me wherever I went. I experienced many forms of abuse in my relationships. It wasn't until March of 2014, when I was raped by my son's father, that I realized I was beyond broken. I knew I needed healing and I needed it quick. My son and I moved into a battered women and children's shelter. From there, I continued to heal. I put myself into support groups. At the support group, I received a flyer for the Family Justice Center WINGS program, Women Inspired to Grow and Succeed. I knew deep down this was exactly where I needed to be. The WINGS program provided everything I needed for my healing journey. My son and I attended the full six weeks. I traveled about 40 minutes because I was eager to be fed the knowledge WINGS had to offer. They offer childcare and a nutritious meal. As a single mom, all of this was a beautiful blessing. Once I completed the program, I received a certificate. This had sparked something inside of me. I felt comfortable now to ask for help. I was no longer alone. I had other people who understood me and would be there for me. Shortly after, I enrolled in college. I've received my associate's degree, completed a medical assistant program, and I'm currently working part-time at John Muir Health as a medical imaging assistant. I am also excited to share with you all that I was selected to be a community fellow in 2019 at Family Justice Center. The leadership program has built my character even more. I am able to dream big. I wanna be a speaker and share my testimony. I'm, I am a health coach. I enjoy making my all natural products. I have taken entrepreneur classes with the help of Family Justice Center. I am trying to bring all of this together so I can be who I was created to be before the mistakes, abuse, and trauma. I wanna make this my career so I can provide a home for my son. 
We've moved six times in the last six years. We both are ready to have a place to call home. I can't wait to see how God is going to use me to help others with my story. The Family Justice Center has played a big role on what I call life recovery. I did not have to go down the wrong path this time. Instead, I had loving people holding out their hand saying, no, honey, come this way. I am now confident to say I am not walking this journey alone. I have the resources I need to work through the trials that may come my way. The best is yet to come. Thank you for the opportunity to share my journey with you. Thank you, Gloria. We cannot do the work that we do without all of your support. You saw how the Family Justice Center helped Gloria achieve her goals. And um, I'm going to ask you to think about how you can help in four different dollar amounts. Now I get the wonderful idea to try to share my screen. And I am going to share my screen um, as well as I can here and pull up the different fund a need programs. I uh, hope all of you can see my screen and if you can't, please put something in the chat. Okay. We're going to start with $2,500. Your donation of $2,500 will support 10 clients to get their dream jobs through the Center's Women Inspired to Grow and Succeed programs. We call it WINGS for short. You saw how the WINGS program helped Gloria. If you want to support this need, please click on the link in the comment box now. Everyone, oh, here we go. Um, so I wanted just to remind you, $2,500 will help 10 glorious, 10 people out of the 4,400 clients to get their dream jobs through the Center's Women Inspired uh, Program. Please, $2,500. If that works, if you can do that, that's great. Because we need... We need to help each and every one in Contra Costa County that needs assistance. So absolutely, fund a need at $2,500. That's what we're asking for. And we hope that you can think about it and think about what that would fund. If you can't do $2,500, then we're going to go, I'm going to ask you for $1,000. The $1,000 will help 10 children receive trauma-informed academic support for one whole year in our Success Academy. Although our clients' children have been going through distance learning, Success Academy has remained constant for them throughout the pandemic. Children have been able to virtually meet with their tutors every week to get the academic support that they need. But think about it, $1,000 will help 10 children to receive trauma-informed academic support. So while there are victims that are being abused, there are children who are watching this, children who need your support. And we don't wanna let down our children at any time. So please think about, can I do this? Can I break up and provide $1,000 to a very, very needy population at this time. Remember that during the pandemic, our families were at home with their abusers 24-7. It is our responsibility and our job as a community to come together and take care of our children and help them through that trauma. If you can't do $1,000, I understand. It's been a tough year, but I want you to think about maybe $500. It allows us 
to support what we call the Project Connect community-led survival circles. And these gatherings are monthly, and right now they're on Zoom, and hopefully in person soon. And they have provided much support and empowerment for survivors and builds a strong sense of community to our center, even in the hardest of times. One thing that happens in an abusive situation is that the, the survivor is, uh, feels alone and is made to feel alone. And these circles let them know that they and their family are not alone at any time. So $500. And if you can't do $500 all at once, we do take reoccurring donations. We will take anything that your heart can give. For those of you who cannot do $500, I want to encourage you to think about the $100 where that will go to support a child when they go to school with a full backpack. And this, this year, our students are scheduled to go back to school in the fall, and we need to make sure that they have all the supplies they need. School is different than even when I was in school, which was many years ago, and I don't remember getting a backpack. But now they need backpacks, they need pens, pencils, paper, hand sanitizer, and believe it or not, Kleenex, uh, air, uh, you know, colored pencils, their own stapler. Um, these backpacks are very important. And for some students, these backpacks represent hope for their future, hope that they will learn and be able to be in a setting where they could learn. And for $100 for all of us, we can support that. We can support getting these children backpacks for the needs that they have. And we want to support them. We want to break the trauma cycle that is occurring in our county. So as we go through this event, you're going to have the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to donate to the Family Justice Center. And you can click in the comment section now to make a donation. Even if it's $5, those are $5 that are going to go to someone who absolutely needs it. We started this event with $83,000 in scholarship and sponsorships. 83. Our thermometer is not quite where we want it to be. However, I know that those of you who are watching and those of you who have already sponsored, we really appreciate you. We would like to ask you to help us to get to $100,000 with your help. You will be able to see how much you've raised for the center through the little thermometer that will appear on the screen throughout the day. And I'm not the one putting the thermometer up, so there'll be no technical glitches on my part. So again, I ask all of you, let's see how high we can get to this together. And we're going to be here with you all afternoon. So let's make fun. Let's have fun together. Let's be together. Share this with family and friends. Say, hey, come, come on over. Socially distance, of course, in a way where we can watch and see this together. It's a hope-filled journey. And I am so pleased to be here with you today on this journey. I do want to tell all of you, thank you again for being here. And thank you for thinking about those who are in need who are living a silent and difficult time and who may or may not still be at home with their abuser 24 seven, but they don't know, the abusers don't know that we actually have a fighting chance in the Family Justice Center and they are available at all times and that people don't have to suffer in silence. And I feel my cousin's spirit with me today because I'm so proud to be her voice. And even though we were close, and even though she had family surrounding her, she still was silent and she was scared. And later we found out it was the threat of her children's life. So we don't want that to happen anymore. And I urge you to join me with, on this journey 
I will be here with you throughout the day and I will be here to answer questions and guide you through how we can do this journey together. I'm gonna um, turn it over to our team and I will be available. I'll be back at two o'clock and I hope to see all of you at two o'clock plus the 10 other people that you've asked to join. There's more to come. You'll hear more from our other clients. You'll hear more from those who give, those who more who give their time, their energy. But more importantly, we're gonna take this journey together to provide hope to the ones who need us the most. And it's not the ones that are vocal, it's the ones that are silent, including our children that need us. And I am so honored and proud to be on this journey with you. Thank you. My origin story actually starts in North Korea almost 100 years ago. Maybe that's not where we're going to go today. But I think I do want to talk about the, the story of immigration. That is really very central to my life and my existence. So my mom was born in North Korea, and she crossed the border, the North and South uh, border, right before the Korean War that started in 1950. And she was an immigrant, actually living in South Korea, originally from North Korea, and she was very aware of her accent living in South Korea. And then in her 40s, she immigrated to New York from South Korea. And again, you know, her English was limited and life was hard for her. So I come from that background and what it means to be an immigrant, uh, be a stranger on the strange land and uh, all the different assets and problems and challenges and opportunities that uh, are brought together when you're an immigrant. And I myself am an Im immigrant. You know, with my parents, I came here with my brothers also. Um, I moved from Seoul to New York City uh, in the 80s. And then I moved from New York to Berkeley uh, in 1991. So lots of changes in my life. And I have had opportunities and privilege also to think a lot about you know what it means to belong somewhere and what it means to be really inclusive so i think that's kind of what i bring to my work as well like my personal value around how to create this space that feels safe and that would welcome anyone that would really allow you to feel that you belong because i think that sense of community and belonging is what really can help bring people together and end violence so that's my st origin story, uh, being strangers on the strange land and just learning about the language and culture. And my family really had to overcome a lot of different barriers, in, including poverty, uh, you know, language access, and just not knowing really anything about the systems here. So I think I'm very aware of the barriers that our clients experience on a daily basis. And I'm really in tune with their struggles and challenges. And also what can help them um, overcome their bar barriers and thrive. You know, I'm not just interested in supporting people through crisis. I would love to support them to thrive. Like I have, like my family has managed. It took a little while, it took a lot of work, but I think it can happen. That sense of belonging and having people around you that care for you. It may not be your family. Right? Sometimes our clients are from dysfunctional families with a lot of difficult dynamics, but it could be just someone. It could be just one person that cares for you, that gives you unconditional love. I think love 
is the secret ingredient. So I've been uh, in the social justice space, you know, forever. I think since college. And when I was in law school, I worked for different social justice organizations. I remember my internship with Legal Aid Society of New York, working with homeless families. So that was kind of my first internship that really left a big mark on me, like how it is to have all these homeless individuals. Now I think we call them unhoused individuals and all the systems that have failed them. So that was my first internship and my social, social justice work began from there. Uh, but I had a little detour and worked for a um, big law firm because I had to pay off my student loans. And I think six years in two different law firms really helped me, I think, understand also the capitalist side and the corporate side and what it meant to uh, survive there. And then I've been in the uh, legal aid field. I mean, I was in legal aid for many, many years before I came to the Family Justice Center as the founding executive director in 2014. And in the past seven years, I have grown this organization from a budget of $400,000 to about $3 million. And also we went from like a small pilot center that opened one day a week in 2011 uh, to three uh, fully operational centers open five days a week. And so it's been 10 years uh, here at the Family Justice Center. We have been open and serving clients and we hope to go another 10 years and serving even more people. It was really hard in March last year. So we are recording this uh, toward the end of March this year. So like a year later, I have a lot of thoughts. So right before the shelter in place went into effect, about a week before I got a call from a supervisor from the Board of Supervisors uh, here in Contra Costa County. Uh, she also serves on the board here at the Family Justice Center. Her name is Diane Burgess. And Diane called me one week before the shutdown and said, Susan, this is going to be bad. Get ready. So I was really fortunate in that I had that call one week before and I got our three centers ready to actually uh, be able to provide services virtually while keeping the doors open. I have stayed open physically throughout the pandemic because I had one week advance notice to get ready. But what that meant was that uh, some of our um, staff were able to work from home from day one of shutdown. Their phones and their computers, the internet connection and the uh, uh, Dropbox, all of those things were ready. So that uh, on any given day in March last year, when the world shut down, or it felt like at least California shut down, uh, we had two staff members on site per day and then the rest of the staff were working from home. And again, we have never closed our centers because I thought about our clients, right? If you're experiencing domestic violence, elder abuse, child abuse, and you are finally ready to end that and trying to get help, and you come to this place and our doors are shut, how would that feel? You know, putting ourselves in our client's shoes, we made the difficult decision to stay open. And it wasn't easy. Some of our staff were a little scared at first. Like, can we get this disease? How can we possibly stay open? But we were able to stay open and stay healthy. And I think um, that was really important. And in fact, in 2020, throughout the pandemic, we served more clients than 2019. We saw an increase of about 13 or 14 percent in terms of the number of clients. And secondly, uh, we also had to switch our services and uh, programs because we wanted to be responsive to the needs of our clients in this pandemic. So what we learned in March last year was that the economy shut down and our clients lost their jobs. It was really as simple as that. Most of our clients are women of color uh, in low wage jobs, such as restaurants and hotels, cleaning. Remember back in March, uh, house cleaners were not allowed to go and clean. They were supposed to stay home. So a lot of our clients, in fact, most of them lost jobs in March and they were experiencing hunger right away, uh, let alone uh, there were um, eviction threats. So anyway, we quickly shifted our work and we became a mini funder for our clients and we were able to give $500 per family. And in 2020, I think we assisted I don't know, 300 families, lots of families with cash assistance uh, we were able to do. Plus we provided grocery cards, Chromebooks, at the beginning food boxes. So we had to be responsive, right? That's 
the thing about I think our model. We can be very um, agile and very quick in meeting the needs. And the pandemic brought these needs: food, Chromebooks, right, grocery cards. So we were able to bring those resources to our clients. That's one. That's the second thing. The third thing I was I would say about the pandemic is this: we really I think became much closer to our partner agencies, including um, public agencies. COVID actually has brought us together. So um, we have been hosting uh, the COVID related community care coalition in our county, bringing together not just our traditional partners working in the area of interpersonal violence, but safety net partners, housing partners, public health partners, all of us coming together uh, once a month to share relevant, timely, and accurate information, because that's what's really needed. So at the beginning, it was information about COVID tests. Where do you get it? Can you get it if you're undocumented? Is it free? You know, all those questions were answered. And later on, we uh, answered questions about COVID-related relief. And then most recently, COVID vaccination. You know, we are sharing information about that, in addition to uh, COVID-related tenant assistance. So there are a lot of really you know, important resources out there and we need to share that information. So we have come to um, play that role like as a hub organization of information. So that's another thing about COVID and looking to the future, uh, you know, we've learned a lot, right? In this COVID time. I think one of the main lessons is that our, our country, our society, has a lot of flaws and inequities and structural racism and systemic racism. And now, you know, we have also seen the um, anti-Asian violence and hate. Um, you know, COVID has allowed us to really see this. Like, yeah, there are lots of gaps in our systems. And we also have seen a lot of opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, you know, the uh, federal government has given really important COVID-related uh, re relief the state government here too. And uh, eviction, for instance, has been suspended as it relates to COVID. So like there are things we can do. Uh, also um, support for undocumented families has become uh, available and real. So I feel like what we have seen is that we, if we have the public and community will to make changes in terms of policies and you know, systems, we can make those changes. And I think that's what COVID has allowed us to see. It is on us, right? We are in the driving seat. I mean, we, all of us together in our community, um, we can make changes. That's what we've learned. Yeah, for sure. Because um, we are also part of the California Family Justice Network. And I uh, sit on the steering committee for the network. So we are very connected to other family justice centers. There are 25 of us in California. And also even outside California, uh, we are connected to other family justice centers around the country. And my email or our newsletter goes out to you know, all kinds of people. So when, I, uh, when we offer the Family Justice Institute trainings, we see people from really all over, uh, not just California, but out of California as well. So we have had these opportunities to share really good information with a lot of people out there. Uh, you know, I always go back to uh, my uh, maternal grandma from North Korea. So I always have a memory of her with her uh, like hearing aid. And at the time, you know, she didn't have this hearing aid that like could that you could hide in your ear. She was always carrying this box connected to her ear. So there was this like little box that she always carried so that she could hear people. So I always felt like I was a singer or like a, an actor when talking to her because she was, you know, put this box in front of me. What she taught me is love. She has so much love to everyone around her. And especially to those who didn't have as much as she did, she would always share everything she had with people around her. So she inspired me and I always thought, you know, she, she's just my foundation. So that's what I would say. And then later on in my life, I was blessed with a mentor who taught me how to be a leader uh, uh, when I was at Bay Area Legal Aid. I was specifically mentored and coached by my former boss, Ramon Arias, who grew up in Coachella Valley, California, uh, on an okra farm. And he always reminded me of his origin, you know, where he came, came from. His people came from the farm, farm workers. And 
he's always done you know uh, social justice work and he didn't just you know watch me do my thing as my boss he actually reached out to me and mentored me and coached me for 10 years and he was very clear and intentional about what he was doing with me and to me, which was to help me become an executive director of a nonprofit, of a social justice organization. And I really appreciated him for that. I couldn't be who I am doing what I do without him. And that's what I also try to do with staff that I have here. You know, they, they're not just gonna become leaders, right? They need additional support and nurturing and very intentional conversations about what it means to be a nonprofit leader. So that's what I try to do. So I would say two things. One is that, uh, as I mentioned, when they come in, they're coming in crisis and they need help with uh, restraining orders, custody issues, uh, some mental health counseling needs. And we assisted over 4,000 individuals in 2020. And we looked at their family composition and they had a, about 3,000 children under age 18. And we, have been uh, developing more programs for children and youth, but I think we need to do more. And we started doing more in terms of building partnership with other organizations that serve children and youth and developing more resources for children and youth. And I think that's really a key because uh, we know that intergenerational violence exists and that it really has long-term impact on um, people, especially children. And these children who grow up in violent homes have poor outcomes in terms of educational and health outcomes. So I think we need to help break the cycles of violence and we have an opportunity because we have families, I mean, parents who come in here for support and they have children in their homes. So we need to find a way to reach those children when they come here to connect with services. That's one area. The second area really is generally speaking prevention. Right. I mean, you know, as a movement, we have been doing a lot of work around intervention. You know, we've done law enforcement training. We have improved the laws in response to, uh, you know, crime victims. Uh, we've done um, a lot of policy advocacy in terms of giving notice to, uh, you know, uh, victims about the danger of strangulation. So a lot of really good work has happened in the area of intervention. But prevention is, I think, definitely our future. And by prevention, I don't mean just workshops on domestic violence or dating violence. Workshops are workshops. That's just one very like narrow field of education. What I mean by prevention is really looking at the public health approach to causes and root causes of violence. So what are some of the root causes? You know what it is, right? One, lack of, a, lack of economic opportunities is a root cause of violence. Uh, the really uh, mis misogynistic gender norms are also root causes of violence. Um, the, like a the lack of social cohesion is also another root cause of violence. So we really should look at the root causes of violence and our family justice model really allows us to look at them and bring additional resources. So not just help with restraining orders or counseling, but really looking at overall holistic family support, like parenting classes, for instance, or jobs and training, for, you know, job trainings, um, micro enterprise development programs. So we studied all of those programs already, but we want to expand on those programs to really understand why we have these programs, right? That is because we want to prevent violence and the way to prevent violence is by addressing the root causes of violence. What we're trying to do here is to build informed and engaged community. So regardless of the amount of dollar donations or you know whether they give us their time or even just like kind words, we are trying to build community together with our donors and they are our partners. That's how we see them. And also we believe that we could prevent violence by letting everyone know what we do at the Family Justice Center. There are still a lot of people out there in our community who don't know what they do or what resources we provide. So our donors really get to know us and I'm hoping that they're gonna be ambassadors for us to let everyone know in their own community that we can provide support and resources for our clients. So really it's about building partnership and building community.
It really is a pleasure to be here with you, having a chance to chat, uh, Chief French. So um, tell us a little bit about your journey. Where'd you grow up and why did you choose this profession? So I'm a Bay Area native. I grew up here in the Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco, moved to the East Bay at a young age, lived in San Pablo, and then moved to the town of Hercules. So I'm local. I've never left the Bay Area. I love it here, and I don't think I'll ever leave here. So I chose the profession because I do have this innate sense of service to our community. And so I wanted to be a police officer. And I, I know that a lot of people say it's, it's a cliche that I want to help, help people and service people. And that, that really is true. I have this sense of service within me. And that came from early on when I was a young child and I lived in San Pablo and I had an uh, instance with my brother in which I didn't feel safe as a young child. And I didn't want anybody else to feel unsafe the way I felt um, during that time. And it was a, a day when we were walking to school and we actually saw the letters KKK written on a fence and on the sidewalk in front of us. And I didn't understand why if these people were such bad people, why they weren't in jail. I thought that bad people should go to jail. And I had that, you know, I, I wanted, I didn't want anybody else to feel the way I felt in, in that unsafe way as a child. And so I kind of just kept that with me over time. And, you know, that was probably the first seed I had planted in me that, you know, I could become a police officer and I could make people feel safe. And I, I just kind of continued to explore that. So, where did you grow up and why did you choose your profession? Well, uh, similar to you, I am a native of the Bay Area. I grew up in Oakland, in East Oakland. And um, I'm a child of the 50s and the 60s. I know that was a long time ago. But one of the things about that time is that it was really a time of so many movements. We had the civil rights movement. We had the anti-Vietnam War movement, Black Power movement. There was the women's movement, uh, gay rights movement. Uh, and we watched so many things, much of it on TV, like seeing Little Ruby Bridges take the first steps to integrate schools uh, in the South. We saw people sitting in trying to integrate lunch counters. And we were always questioning how we saw people being treated, like questioning why some lives seemed to be valued so much more uh, than others. And so it was a time when people were fighting for equal rights, to, fighting for the rights to vote. Um, and we, we watched people being attacked by dogs and um, just for trying to get equal dignity uh, and respect. So one of the things I found out early on was that um, people who made the laws, people who fought in court, um, that they had the ability to make radical changes in our society changes that help to provide equal access and equal rights for everybody, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity or gender. And so that's how I got the seed in my heart to want to be a lawyer, because I wanted to, um, to, to, to be that kind of a person who could make a difference in our society. I'm wondering, um, we, both of our offices have uh, deputies uh, at the uh, Family Justice Center, um, or at least we try to staff them. So do you think there's a benefit to that, to having uh, a detective working at the Family Justice Center? Sure. Um, we actually have our entire uh, domestic and sexual unit working at the Family Justice Center because we know how important it is to link victims with other services. So it, it's really provided more of a holistic, you know, um, healing for a, a victim or survivor because we're not just doing our part in terms of looking at prosecution and, and how we can get this case charged, but we're also doing a handoff to other service providers so that the victims can get all the services that they need, not just for themselves, but also for their family. So um, I, I think that our detectives feel a, a greater sense of, um, they feel a greater sense of doing something more and not just our little part, mm -hmm. um, that, that we're part of something bigger, being uh, at the Family Justice Center and being able to connect with all those service providers. 
And so they, they've built relationships so they know what all the service providers do. Whereas, you know, when you're just a, a police officer or we're working in this building, we, turn, we tend to be a little siloed and not really engaged with a lot of the other service providers. We might know who they are and might refer them, but when you have that actual relationship where you can talk about the certain cases and really come up with a plan, I, I think it's just better service to our community and our victims. I think similarly for uh, the district attorney's office, ha having a deputy district attorney uh, at the Family Justice Center is really uh, something that is very important to us. You know, when a person has experienced um, um, crime, when they have been the victim and finally get the courage to speak up and to speak out, it can be an extremely uh, traumatic time in their life. And uh, often people would find that they'd have to go from place to place, you know, seeking help, seeking services. And this is the beauty of having the Family Justice Center. Uh, it's almost like uh, we say, you know, it takes a village, but that's what's really happening here. It is a village of services where people can go and get uh, help. Victims and survivors don't have to go from place to place right there on the scene. They can talk to someone who can let them know if truly uh, we believe a crime has been committed. We can get them help with uh, law enforcement, get them help with services. And so uh, I think it is truly important, the collaboration that we have all built to uh, bring services to those who have been harmed by others in our community. So what is your vision of the Family Justice Center's future? And what do you want to see more of? My goal, my vision for the Family Justice Center is that it will continue to be that place, uh, a place at the heart of our community where there are resources for victims, there are educational services for all of us, and it's a place where people can find hope, people can find healing, and a place where people can feel welcomed and that they're getting the help and services that they need. It also provides a place for collaboration uh, for uh, everyone in our community. And so um, I know last year we had just an opportunity to serve a certain part of the community in Richmond and the Family Justice Center was our meeting place. It was our hub. So we had everybody there meeting together and talking about how we could make the community better. So that's my vision is that we keep being that welcoming place where people are valued, where every voice is heard and where we provide the services that people I actually share the same vision that that we continue to be the hub, the, the center point for um, families to to get their, all the resources and services that they need. And I hope that we can actually expand, um, you know, with job helping people get jobs and and helping with additional counseling and just all those things that are needed for uh, community members to thrive not just survive but thrive in our communities so I, I think that we're well on our way and that we've been doing a great job and that we can just expand and, and do more my hope is that that we can end interpersonal violence in our communities period i mean that that is just my hope I, I hope that i won't have a job that we won't need the that we won't need you know the family justice center will be something a, a place where we just you know people are, are thriving and surviving and getting together and it's not about something tragic that has happened to them mm -hmm. so my hope is to end interpersonal violence and i think that that if we continue to provide people with the resources and services even at an early age i mean i really hope that we can um really service our communities. And, th and this is a, a great time as we talk about police reform and we talk about doing things different across the nation and how we provide services. Um, getting people services at a young age will help us to prevent this interpersonal violence and this community violence that we've seen and we can get to that point. So that's my hope for the future. I know it's a big task. I know it's a big ask, but um, I hope that within my lifetime, we could get to a place where, you know, mm -hmm. interpersonal violence is, you know, something that we used to deal with and we're not having to deal with anymore. I hope that we get to a place where we're not talking about people who have been victims of interpersonal uh, violence. I hope that we get to a place for a community that is that's vibrant, that's inclusive, um, where everybody is, is welcome where everyone is accepted and where everyone is respected and valued. Um, I would love to see a world that's free of hate, free of fear and uh, free of violence, a safe, safe place to be. 
Now, we know that we haven't gotten there yet, and so that's why I do appreciate you thinking about uh, different ways that we can to continue to deliver um, services to our community, to continue to hold people accountable, to help people to heal um, in our communities who have been victims and who are survivors. Um, but my biggest, my biggest hope is that we would have a vibrant and inclusive community where all voices, everyone is safe, and welcome and accepted. Hello, I'm Pat Rickey. On behalf of myself and our team here at Blackhawk Media, we would like to present this performance to bring attention to the great work done by the Family Justice Center. The Family Justice Center helps families, spouses, children, or elders suffering from interpersonal abuse. Family Justice Center is unique because they provide essential consolidated help all under one roof. Their great work relies on your support please visit cocofamilyjustice.org for more information and to donate. And now I'd like to share with you my original composition inspired by the Family Justice Center and the families they serve.
Betty Felton from the Contra Costa Regional Health Foundation, and I'm pleased to be here and support the Family Justice Center. The Contra Costa Regional Health Foundation was founded in 2003 to raise awareness and provide support to Contra Costa Health Services. We're very pleased to have been a partner of the Family Justice Center. They are an amazing organization and we celebrate them. Mi nombre es Esmeralda Lares. Yo en lo personal quiero agradecerle mucho a la Fundación de Contracosta de Salud uh, en, en ayudarle al, al lugar del Centro de la Familia de Justicia y el lugar de Stand que les ayudan con fondos para que ellos nos puedan brindar apoyo a, a personas como a mí o a la comunidad. Este, les quiero agradecer mucho por la ayuda que brindan a ellos. Hi, my name is Marisol Martinez. I was born in Mexico. I never knew my parents and uh, I was raised by uh, foster parents. When I was 13, my foster parents gave me to me a man who said that was my father. Uh, he told me that he married here in the United States and he wanted me, he want me to come and live with him. When I came here to United States, he um, he handed me to other men who who was honored for um he was honored in um a bar when other girls and young women uh they were for him like uh, a prostitute. Uh, when I was 15, I became I, I became pregnant, but I, I had no idea who the father was. I had no idea how to take care of him, but I love him because it's something that so for my first time, I feel something that was mine. After my son, he forced, uh, he, uh, he forced me to go back to work. I was forced to, to use drugs and rape many, many times over and over again for days and nights. And that happened for many years. When I was 19, I met a man in the bar. Um, we can call him Ernesto. He, he told me that he wanted me to help, help me and, um, and help me to escape in, for, in the, escape for the line. He teach me a lot, a lot of things, like how to cook, how to um, take care of my son, how kind of like perfect family. But that happened for a little bit short time. He be changed all the time and became so aggressive with me insulted me and beat me almost every day. I, I tried to live in Ernesto, but I became pregnant with my second child. We keep together for 
few more years until the last incident when a rest of me started strangling myself. They shot me, they pushed me, they tried to throw, throw, throw me from the second floor. So that's when um, when my daughter, uh, she got the phone and called 911. The police explained me what happened and how my daughter, she, uh, she saved my life. Um, that's when I noticed that one of the officers, they, they talked to me and they told me that I'm not alone. The police arrested Ernesto. No, only, only one time, many times. And from there, I get, um, I start to get the, start the process of, of begin to empower the restraining order and start uh, my new life. When I heard about the Family Justice Center and the, and I was amazing news because um, all the doors that was open for me in, in, in that time when I escaped and I tried to find my own life. That's how many, many resources they came together in only one place. And no matter for how long, how many years we, we survive, the abuse is there and we learn from there. And everything what happened to me, I try to figure out and provide the same resources what I get in the past for the other, other people, other victims. I'm really I'm happy to be uh, and be part of the staff of the Family Justice Center because what I what I know and what I knew in the past, they taught me like experience of like try to to help others like uh, me. They they can um they can they can stand out for for themselves and and change the life. My name is Rosa Dennis, and I am a navigator with the Family Justice Center in East County, the Antioch office. At the Family Justice Center, we've learned that interpersonal violence is indiscriminate. It does not matter your age, your race, your gender identity, your socioeconomic status, or your educational background. Anyone can become the target of violence. My coworkers and I are confronted with this sad reality every day, and it is especially loud where children are concerned. Between July in 2019 and June of 2020, there were 6,529 child abuse allegations referred to Children and Family Services. We know them simply as CS CFS. Children are especially vulnerable now more than ever given the pandemic. And children who experience violence or who are exposed to it in the home face a myriad of challenges as the exposure can wreak havoc on their mental health and has the potential to shape their behavior their ability to learn, and cause lasting psychological harm. Family Justice Center makes it a priority to grow our relationships with resources related to children's services. Our ultimate goal is to amplify children's voices in this discussion of interpersonal violence.
Major General Dan Helix was key and such a great proponent in the unfolding of the opening of the Family Justice Center for Central, uh, Central Contra Costa. He put forth unlimited, uh, immeasurable energy and effort in helping to raise the funding and, and, and making sure that we had all that we needed from the city and city resources to be able to open the doors initially here in Concord for the Family Justice Center and working so closely with Susan Kim. He himself had come from an environment of uh, a home environment that was, um, that was full of domestic violence. And, and for him to be able to survive that environment as a boy and to go through uh, an orphanage and end up becoming a, a, a general in the army, as well as a council member and mayor of Concord was, was something to behold. And no wonder he was such a powerful force and a strength to all of us who were working so hard to open the Family Justice Center. So thank you to retired Major General Dan Helix. We love you and you, uh, you will be missed as a, uh, as we mourn your passing uh, just here recently. So thank you for all that you have done.
Hi, my name is Diane Burgess, and I sit on the Board of Supervisors for Contra Costa County, and this year I am the chair of the board. And I've always been a volunteer since I was a little girl. I used to volunteer at the convalescent hospital. Even in high school, I was a candy striper. And if you don't know what that is, you're not as old as me. But I always was of service and I got involved in leadership when I was in school. And so when I got into college, I worked for a um, group home and I realized that I could take my love of volunteering, of being of service, and I could make it a part of my career. And so I studied nonprofit management and then I got married and I did all these things. And my son was uh, diagnosed with a rare disease. And then all of my years of learning and, and experiencing things, I was able to take a moment that was very painful and scary. And I was able to help people while helping myself because I felt, you know, like I didn't have any power. But when I could help other people, it helped me heal. And it also helped make things better for the people that were affected by this disease, which empowered me to then go into working for a nonprofit and leading uh, work in the environmental sector. And um, because I just was able to pour my heart into it and feel proud of the work that I was doing, making the world a better place, I got asked to run for office. And so eight years later, I'm sitting on the board of supervisors and I get the great privilege to work with the, with the um, Family Justice Center. And we've been able to open a uh, Family Justice Center in East Contra Costa County. And what you're seeing working in the Family Justice Center are a bunch of people like me probably even better than me, because what they're doing is they're committing their careers to helping people. And often they've been affected by things as well. And they're doing similar to what I did. They're saying, you know what, this hurts. This was traumatic, but I'm gonna heal myself by helping others. I'm gonna take what I've learned and I'm gonna help people, maybe help them not have to have such a terrible experience. So that's why I'm involved with the Family Justice Center. I've got some terrific partners on the board and the staff and the leadership of the Family Justice Center is one that I am so trusting and confident in because they really do great work. And that's why I'm involved with the Family Justice Center. My vision for the Family Justice Center is to take the growth that we've seen over the last 10 years where we started in a, in a little substation in Richmond and now have three centers. What could we do? You know, East Contra Costa is growing and it's seen a lot of growth. And I'm so proud of the fact that we were able to bring the center to East Contra Costa. And so my, my hope is that we can really help people feel confident in getting help. And it's been proven that if, if you have the center here, they're more likely to be able to ask for help, which helps decrease the amount of violence that we're gonna see. I'd like to see more family justice centers throughout the state. And I'd love to see the state funding these centers rather than us having to do all of this work just to raise money. But until then, it's really important that everybody is donating and supporting the Family Justice Center because then we can show what we're doing is making a difference. We are a partner with law enforcement. We're a partner within the communities. We are the trusted messengers that help people feel confident in not only getting help, but also growing and becoming more stable and helping provide uh, a place where children are going to be able to thrive and go to school and be fed and learn and be able to be better partners in our community. So my vision is that we'll hopefully not need a Family Justice Center in the future. I hope that we will get more funding on a state and federal level. But I really would like to make sure that today we are helping it grow so that we can go into the future making things better.
Tim Grayson, assembly member for Assembly District 14. I was raised in an environment with a family that was deeply involved in civil service as public servants. I, I grew up around firefighters and police officers and nurses, and there was no doubt in my mind that at some point I was going to be involved in some type of public service only to live long enough to become the critical response chaplain for the Concord Police Department. And it was there that I really started to find that fulfillment and that purpose that I had been looking for in, in how could I best give back. And in doing so, uh, serving as the Concord uh, Police Chaplain, I found myself on numerous calls uh, that involved domestic violence. It, uh, it was something that hit to the core. When I started walking into these scenarios and, and, and this environment of violence and, and realizing that the victim was more than just uh, a victim of abuse, but, but a victim of captivity, not literal chains and not, not literally a, a rope tying them to something in many, many cases. It, it was a, a victim of, of circumstance and logistics and, and not having transportation or, or the fact that the only way to have a roof over the head or, or to have food on the table was to stay in that environment. And something just resonated in me that, that action had to be taken. It was when Chief Guy Swinger came to the Concord Police Department that he looked at me as chaplain. And the first thing he said to me when we met each other was, when are we going to open a family justice center? I looked to him and said, you're going to have to educate. That was opening the door that he was looking for because he immediately took me to San Diego. We took a tour of the... Uh, family Justice Center down there. And from that point, there was no doubt in my mind, we were going to have a full-on Family Justice Center in Central Contra Costa County, doing work, policy work in Sacramento, that I had the, uh, I had the tools that uh, at my disposal to be able to reach out through budgetary means and seek out a, a, a budget uh, line item that would allow $10 million to go toward family justice centers statewide. When I realized that, that's when the, the dream started blossoming from just an idea to reality. I started having discussions and what was amazing was that as I reached out to every colleague of mine, 80 assembly members, we, uh, including myself, there was, there was no resistance. There was no question. It was unanimous across the board, so much so that I, I went to the Senate and all 40 senators joined. And it was a unanimous effort, both from the Assembly and the Senate, to provide support, monetary support, to the Family Justice Center Network of California to be able to allocate funding that would help expand, that would help build, and that would help further the reach of the Family Justice Center into communities and lives that otherwise would have never realized help. We were able to secure $10 million. Thank you to the governor for that vision and sharing that vision with us. And we will continue to do more, continue to seek out for more help in the future as it comes. And uh, little did I know that when we brought on the star, and that was Ms. Susan Kim, that the vision was greater than just a family justice center. It was a network of family justice centers that would reach the far extensions of our county. And so when that family justice center opened and I began to see as, as people were coming in and out and those that were looking for a way of escape or looking for help, they would come in through those doors with such disparity uh, on their face and, and expression, but then they would walk out with gleams of hope. I realized then that is why we did all of this. And that's why all the labor and hard work went into this. And the patience was worth it to go through all the, the red tape and bureaucracy and everything we had to, uh, all the challenges we had to face in raising the funding. So here we are supporting the Family Justice Center. Why? Because it gives hope to those who had no hope and I believe it became the lifeline, the lifeline in which many, many lives have been saved.
Thank you, Family Justice Center, for making a difference and saving lives in our community. Everybody. I'm Carrie Gregg and this is my husband John and we are from the Bay Church and we want to let you know how much we love the Family Justice Center and why we support the Family Justice Center. We, um, we are in Contra Costa County and at our heart we have people. That's actually our mission as a not-for-profit which is a local church. Mm -hmm. uh, when we got connected many years ago with the mission of Family Justice Center because we have so many, frankly, victims of domestic violence in our own church family, we said, we've got to do something on a much larger scale. And, and Family Justice Center at that time existed in Richmond and then soon conquered, now Antioch as well. But we jumped on board with the successful uh, vehicle tool system that was already in place. And we have not been disappointed one time. The, the professional um, just incredibly competent and compassionate work uh, Family Justice Center does it makes us so proud and so humbled that we've been able to be part of this uh, mission of family justice to intervene for battered uh, citizens in our county, mostly uh, who are women and children. Mm -hmm. I've had a, an opportunity to um, refer the Family Justice Center many times over these years. And one time in particular, I was just eating at a restaurant downtown Toto Santos Park, and uh, there was a woman who needed some help. And I knew where I could take her. And that was such an incredible thing for me to have that resource in my pocket, but also that we let those that enter our building, which has many people in and out weekly, have a resource for them to go to. So as I took this woman up to the Family Justice Center, the staff and everyone mm -hmm. there did everything that they could to help this woman in need. 
And so I come to you with a, a personal um, experience with the Family Justice Center, but also just knowing that uh, the resources are there to help women and children mm -hmm. is incredible. And we need it so much in our community. With COVID, um, the rise of abuse has just skyrocketed. And I think you probably know that. And for us to have a place like the Family Justice Center with not only are they equipped incredibly legally and professionally, but their compassion to care for those is um, unmatched in our community. We have a uh, principle in our culture, sort of our DNA, and it's this, you can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. And so what we are thinking about often is putting our life right where the need is, not words, just simply show up and do what we can. So our support of this uh, beautiful public service called Family Justice Center is financial. Uh, secondly, it's volunteers. And then there's the uh, vision part of how we feel at the Bay Church about Family Justice Center going forward. And there's no end in sight because as long as there's one person in need, we our commitment uh, truly at the deepest level is to simply show up and in very practical ways, help and serve and support. So as long as there is one person to help, uh, we are going to show up and in practical ways. But, but we need guidance as a not-for-profit and as a local church and how to help. That's where we rely on the legal, the law enforcement and professional guidance of Susan Kim and her team, uh, because we have a willing servant's heart, but we, we need to be honestly kind of guided in how we can be meaningful in our contribution and kind of just not in the way. Mm -hmm. So we want to show up for people one at a time and there is no end in sight because we're going to give the rest of our lives to Contra Costa County, to the beautiful 1 million plus people in this county, uh, and honestly, to the mission of Family Justice Center, which we deeply, deeply believe in. Thanks for joining us today. We're, we're right here with you. We're supporting the Family Justice Center. We're excited to see what the future holds. Um, and we need to work together. We're better together. And I do believe that And even though we feel like this past year has been so crazy and we're on Zoom, we wish we could be there. and We wish we could have our gala like we normally do, but this is what we're doing. And I appreciate the innovation of the Family Justice Center to, and their commitment to bring an event like this. So we're just so grateful that we could participate with you today. Esperanza. La esperanza para mí eres tú, mi querido y adorado hijo, que me enseña cada día a vivir lo no vivido, que me da su sonrisa dando a mi vida sentido, que me impulsa el mañana aunque el hoy no lo hayamos comprendido. Como agua en el desierto eres tú, mi pequeño niño, que calmas mi sed cada día sin que te lo haya pedido. Y le doy gracias a Dios porque ya lo he entendido, que eres la luz de mis noches y el calor en tiempos de frío. La esperanza me alimenta, mi bello y hermoso hijo. Me nutre cada día con su suave y fuerte hilo. Me dice en secreto que no habrá que vivir en vilo, que el mañana existe y que podremos celebrar estar vivos. Esperanza que en el mañana te veré con amigos, tal vez en los brazos de una novia, tal vez de la mano con tus hijos. Esperanza de verte hombre, un hombre fuerte y aguerrido, que lucha por lo justo y ayuda al desvalido. Hoy por ti tengo esperanza de todo, mi preciado y amado hijo. Esperanza del silencio que rehuye del sonido. Esperanza de las almas que nos han dejado, que se han ido. Esperanza de esto y aquello, de la pausa y del ruido. Esperanza que el dolor, el miedo y lo sufrido sean apenas un recuerdo presentando lo aprendido. Hoy más que nunca deseo que después de lo que hemos vivido se vaya la oscuridad y la luz aclare nuestro camino, que se unan los pueblos que no se han comprendido, que se acaben las guerras para vivir más unidos, por fin desaparezcan los odios y nos abracemos entre amigos y cantemos todos de alegría, agradecidos por estar vivos.
Candace Wen here, investigative reporter with NBC Bay Area, and I am so happy and honored to be a part of uh, this event yet again and during this crazy pandemic when so many events are canceling and people can't do things, but the Family Justice Center and all of uh, involved parties have made it possible and they're still doing it virtually on Zoom, so that's amazing. Um, and I'm here to you know, answer a few questions about who I am, uh, how I came uh, to know the Family Justice Center and Susan, the executive director, um, and, and other things to try to, um, um, you know, explain this whole purpose and why this organization needs the community's help um, now more than ever. So how I came to know the Family Justice Center. I think this was about three, four years ago. I had just returned to the Bay Area after being away for about 10 years. And one of my first stories, investigations that I had here uh, was about a former Contra Costa County police officer who was stalking his ex-wife and ended up shooting up her home with her sleeping inside, barely missing her. And our story really was about how did it get that bad? And the thing about this kind of story is that a lot of news agencies would actually, would actually be hesitant to cover it because it involved domestic related issues. And unfortunately, news organizations do shy away from that because things get so-called messy. That's where the Family Justice Center came in for me in my reporting process. I wanted to approach this investigation fairly and responsibly. And I think that's the key word, responsibly. We knew we had a story, but I wanted to make sure I did no harm. We have this in journalism, do no harm. Report the story, spread, you know, spread the news, but don't make a situation worse for people who may be suffering already. And I went to the Family Justice Center. I met Susan Kim, the executive director, and she really helped to provide nuance and context to some of the issues we were raising in terms of uh, challenges to investigating domestic violence, uh, when it comes to victims reporting it and, and issues you might see. And it really helped to give the story some context and some fairness um, so we could move forward with it and really gave the story credibility. I don't think I could have done that without the expertise from the Family Justice Center, especially Susan. So why I support the Family Justice Center? I mean, I think the bigger question is, well, why would anyone not support it? <laughs> but on a personal note, I come from a family that was impacted by domestic violence. And I really did not understand the full impact of that experience until much, much later in life. And I think that may be so true for a lot of people, but especially uh, children impacted by domestic violence. And when I first met Susan uh, for the story I just mentioned, when I toured the center, I immediately thought to myself, I wish that my family had this when we were going through what we were going through. When I was growing up, I thought there was just 911 or maybe a therapist. I didn't know that there was a way to holistically approach an issue as sensitive and as scary as domestic violence until even as an adult, I walked into the Family Justice Center. I was just so impressed when I went into the Family Justice Center and I really saw that it was a one-stop shop for domestic violence victims and their families. You can get food services, uh, prosecution help, therapy was just a phone call away, and everything about it, um, even from walking right in, was designed to make families feel safe. I just didn't know that existed, and here I was, fully, a fully grown woman in the professional world, and I'm still thinking, wow, uh, this exists. It's such a crazy time, and yet you you chose to pick this time to uh, support the Family Justice Center and learn a bit more about it and support it. Uh, thank you again, and the community really appreciates all you do.
Hey everyone, it's Mayor Tim Begallion, and on behalf of the City of Concord, we'd like to say how proud we are to be a partner with the Family Justice Act. We'd like to thank everyone who's here today in support of their efforts, and we hope that you continue to support them for many years to come. The City of Concord is so appreciative of the services they offer to all their families and those individuals that are experiencing crisis in their lives. Through hope, safety, and healing through one door, it truly works, and it is something that we will continue to support for many years to come. And again, we would like to thank them for being a part of our community. Hi, I'm Dominic Aliano, and I'm the Vice Mayor for the City of Concord. I would like to take this moment to thank the Family Justice Center for providing the needed services for the Concord community and for the greater Contra Costa area. But those services wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for uh, the staff members and the volunteers that have dedicated their time to help serve the Family Justice Center and the community. So thank you very much and thank you to everybody who has dedicated their time and efforts for the Family Justice Center. Thank you. Hi, I'm Council Member Carlin Obringer, and as one of the members of the founding council that started the Central County Family Justice Center, I know that it takes a village to bring a vision to fruition. And so I'd like to personally thank the over 50 partner agencies and organizations that have helped to support and sustain the Family Justice Center over the years. Hello, I'm Concord Council Member Laura Hoffmeister, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the donors and supporters to the Family Justice Center here in our community. The Family Justice Center does wonderful work, not only in Concord, but in the surrounding area. COVID-19 has really impacted this organization as well as other nonprofits. And it's through the great contributions from our donors and sponsors that have really made this organization thrive. So I ask you to consider donating if you have not done so already. And I thank all of the donors and sponsors that have already donated and that will continue to donate in the future to this great organization that does so much wonderful work in our community and the surrounding areas. Thank you. I would like to thank the families and their neighbors who have put their trust in the Family Justice Center to help the families that are in the most stressful points of their lives to go through with the Family Justice Center to be chauffeured to all the services that can finally try to break the chain of generation after generation of domestic violence. This is important here in Concord where families come first and we thank you for your trust in the Family Justice Center. Thank you.
afternoon. Oh my goodness. What a great event this has been so far. The stories, the works of art, the testimonies. And remember, I'm taking this journey with you that I chose to be on this journey with you and not get a preview. So I really appreciate you being here. I would like to say that we would love for you to each send this information. We're going to be here till five and we have lots more to come. So if you can get a few more friends on to view our wonderful event today, that would be great. Send it through an email, send your Facebook. It'll take, it's a click of a button. Um, we do want to thank a couple of people, Amita Amita for all her video support and Brad and Terry Dollar for helping us put this program all together. They are geniuses. I can't, I couldn't do what they do and we so appreciate them. If you haven't already donated, I would just like you to take a moment to click the link in the comment section. Your donations go directly towards the families that are impacted by interpersonal violence. I learned today a little bit about the humble beginnings of the Family Justice Center just 10 years ago. It was nice to see Assembly Member Tim Grayson and the NBC Bay Area's own Candace Nguyen talk about why they support the Family Justice Center. And I know and am learning about the different types of interpersonal violence through our family justice navigators. And I was inspired by client testimonies shared today. In fact, I shared one of my family members' journeys whose unfortunate ending didn't have to happen because she was silent and she was scared. And I'm not blaming her. I'm sad that it ended that way. But it inspires me to go on and know that there, is, that there is hope for other families and that her children will provide hope and inspiration for others. If you feel inspired, please just take a moment to click on the link in the comment section. We do have four levels you can donate or you can donate whatever you would like or can. And one of the things that I want to tell you that has inspired me in this entire journey is the fact that my cousin was not the only one. And if she would have reached out, she would have been able to know she wasn't alone. That three years ago, this could happen to anyone. And it happened to me. I was educated. I had a great job. I had everything going for me. And my partner decided that he was in just a bad place. And that, along with substance abuse, led me and my son to flee our home in the middle of the night, the home that I had put blood, sweat, and tears into to get, that I had worked all my life for because he was threatening to kill me and my son. And this could happen to anyone. And no one knew. And now people know because silence. Silence is the hope, and I am not going to be silent anymore, and I am going to put my, my energy into helping everyone that I can, because it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone, and I am proof. I love working with the Family Justice Center. I love working with all the staff and my fellow board members, but more important, I love bringing us together as a community. I was lucky. I was able to run in the middle of the night. I had nothing with me, absolutely nothing. And I lost everything, but I've also gained everything. I have gained my voice and I have gained hope. And that's what I want to give to everyone. So join me today. I am going to pledge a thousand dollars in honor of my cousin, Michelle, and in my honor and my child, my children's honor. It was a very difficult time and it's scary and there is hope. And I hope that my story can inspire everyone that it can happen to anyone. So as we move forward, you can look at our fund of need. You can look at the backpack drive of $100. You can look at donating $2,500 toward to support the center's um, women's inspired to grow and succeed program. You can do that and it'll help people that need help. And it family justice center was there 
for me in a different way where it allowed me to put all my pain into giving and serving others. And so I'm so proud to be here. So think about the $2,500 joining me. If you can't do the $2,500, please join me and the $1,000 pledge. I am so lucky to be able to be here and give $1,000. And I do this graciously with love. And I know that it will help the 10 children because I believe in our children. And these children are seeing trauma that they cannot even describe. The artwork, the music, it's telling you this. You can also give $500. It's really, really important. And this is about our circles. And it allows people to feel supported, loved, and cared for. $500 so that somebody can feel loved, supported, and not alone, that they do not have to be silent. If you can't give $500, Please join me in helping to give a child a backpack for their school in the fall. $100 will get them everything that they need. It's their, their desk that they carry around. And we've done this in another organization where we've heard stories of children where they do their homework under the kitchen table to avoid the fighting where they go and they hide in a corner and they try to do their homework. And that is a lifesaver. And how can we say no to that? So I just want you to please take a moment and share this journey with me. Ask your friends and family to come, to come on. And really, this isn't about us begging for money. This is about us being together in this journey to help all of those in need in Contra Costa County. This is a large and difficult topic and sharing and being able to give hope to one person at a time is really what it's about. And only you can do that. So thank you so much. Oh my goodness, our thermometer came up and I don't have my glasses, so I'm gonna ask my team, what does it say? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's what happens when you're over 21. So we are at 88,900. We're almost there. We want to get to 100,000. And we need you to do that. I need you to do that. Because there are so many others out there that don't have a voice. And we are here to give them that voice. Silence is no longer an option. And I'm living proof of that. So join me, please pledge or call or give us, you know, put a note in the chat and say, I don't know how to do this technology. I'm not sure how to do this. Um, and how can I pledge what I'd like to pledge? And we will help you with that. So we are so inspired. And thank you for being there for me in part for the healing of all of our survivors, but also in healing and allowing me to speak truth to something that's always been difficult to speak truth to. So you are so part of this circle and this circle will get bigger and bigger. I am so excited to continue this journey this afternoon with you. And I really look forward again. I am here with you looking forward to our next, our next segment. So I get to introduce to you our next musical performance. Music is such a soul healer. Maria Jose Montijo is a musician with over 18 years of experience in the healing arts. She was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She's learned that healing starts with acceptance, self-love, and the encouragement of our own body's inherent intelligence and resilience. Maria Jose enjoys living, practicing, and performing in the diversity that is Oakland with her beautiful community. Please join me in welcoming Maria Jose. Thank you all. Hey, 
Family Justice Center, my name is Maria Jose Montijo. I'm gonna give you a little concert. I hope you enjoy it. And I am here in Weichun, Oakland, land of the Chochenyo people. May we be in relationship with this land and its originary people. Amor, 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 aquí lejos de... Tiempo y el espacio, un abrazo holográfico, un abrazo holográfico. That song is called Lejos de Ti, and I just released it. I um, directed and edited the music video, so please check it out if you want. This song is called Silencio. Silencio oculto en la música del aire y un árbol centenario arrulla a un cuervo todo lo que tiene sabia acá. Todo lo que 
que tiene sabia canta. Y el cuervo alza el vuelo, inventa melodías al sol. Del viento al sol, de los rayos del sol, de los rayos del sol, es la música, música, música. Música del misterio es la música, música, música del misterio. oculto en la música del aire en la música ah. en la música ah. con el sol de la órbita de aquel astro un pedazo descendió por el espacio girando lentamente descendió donde a lo lejos el mar Caribe le recibió la luna le acariciaba el mar su cuna le dio y a lo lejos aquel cielo lo miró y de azul lo cubrió por eso es que en Puerto Rico la luna brilla mejor porque es un regalo de esa luna que le fue infiel a Dios tropical Sabes a luz sola, pedazo de luna que cayó al
that song is a song by Puerto Rican composer Silvia Resach. She's a very pioneer uh, female composer from the 40s and 50s in Puerto Rico. Justin Sensor helps women, children, elders, populations that are in the margins, the most endangered. This song is about overcoming, overcoming. It's a bomba song from Puerto Rico, composed by Amarilis Rios. It's called Libre. It calls on our freedom. So if you're, wherever you are, at home, you can sing the coro. It goes like this. Libre, 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 libre. Hoy descubrí libre la libertad de hacer lo que de sentir como yo quiera vivir. Me siento yo, me sentiré 
como paloma volando hasta que pasen los años me voy a ir a un gran lugar con pajaritos volando y cosas bonitas pasando aprenderé a valorar todo lo que iba aprendiendo con el pasar de los años para reír también llorar Siempre sola caminando y poco a poco llegando a aprender y perdonar, agradecer y perdonar y recordar lo que soñé del gran lugar donde llegaré y recordar y agradecer del gran lugar. Donde llegaré libre, 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 donde llegaré libre. Esperando por algo que no llega. Girando como un espera ciegas. Estrella. Fugaces en todas partes, en todas partes, y hay anhelo en el amor, y hay song is called uh, Serpiente, and it's a song about the full moon and waters and our relationship to cycles. Donde la luna en agua se baña. 
en su garganta Misterio es un organismo que brilla como la escarcha donde la luz de la luna alcanza donde la luna en agua se baña donde la luz de la luna alcanza donde la luna en agua se baña a la media noche la luna es el sol, es el sol. Lo La luna es el sol, es un poema, serpiente que se despierta cuando la luna brilla llena. I'm Marsha Cope Hart. I'm here with my daughter, Haley Ann Hart. And hope to us means all the goodness, love, and joy in this wonderful, wonderful world. world.
much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Thank you. At Marathon Petroleum, we're sharpening our focus on meeting the world's growing energy needs while reducing our carbon emissions for every gallon of fuel we produce. In fact, we've committed to reduce manufacturing emissions intensity to 30% below 2014 levels over the next 10 years. An important part of that commitment is our Renewable Fuels Program. We've been producing biofuels for years at our biodiesel plant and joint venture ethanol facilities in the Midwest. We converted our Dickinson, North Dakota petroleum refinery into a renewable diesel facility. And we're investing millions of dollars each year to commercialize proprietary advanced biofuels from our subsidiary, Virant. Now, we're taking another big step toward meeting our commitment to environmental stewardship in California. We're converting our Martinez refinery to produce approximately 730 million gallons a year of renewable fuels. Compared with petroleum fuel production, we estimate that the Martinez Renewable Fuels Plant will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60%, reduce air pollutant emissions by 70%, and reduce water consumption by over a billion gallons per year. At Marathon Petroleum, we're proud to manufacture the fuels that enhance life's possibilities. And we're excited about the role our Martinez refinery will play in reducing the carbon emissions of the energy we all rely on every day. Maria, I'm a navigator working in our West Center. Elder abuse takes different forms. 
physical, mental, emotional, and financial. In 2020, Contra Costa Adult Protective Services had 8,009 active cases of elder abuse. One third of them were financial abuse, one third were physical abuse. Elder abuse is more prevalent than many realize. There are resources available to elder abuse victims. The Family Justice Center partners with several agencies in what we call our Elder Abuse Prevention Program. Together with agencies like Senior Legal Services, Meals on Wheels, and Adult Protective Services, we work to support survivors of elder abuse.
Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying this afternoon as much as I am. It may feel long, but I have to share with you that it's a healing time. And I, I am watching and listening, watching the art. I'm so impressed by it. And it's so moving. And the music is so soothing. Um, I hope you're enjoying this afternoon as much as I am. I have a little bit of a challenge for you that even Susan doesn't know. So I get to surprise her right now. And I'd like for all of you to think about funding a need, but doing it in a way that honors someone who you know or someone who you think needs your help. Five, 10, 15, $50 is fine, but just in their honor. Just join me in doing that. And please bring more to the table, more people to hear about this because one of the things, and Maria sang it, is that silence is not an option any longer. You have empowered me, and I know that you can help empower others. So please, silence is complicity. Isn't that what we learned last year? Isn't that what caused a lot of pain in a lot of our communities? And this is a healing journey for a lot of people. But if you can think of someone, just like I think of my cousin, and just like I think of my life, that if she could have reached out and if only I had told her what had happened to me, maybe she wouldn't have felt so afraid. And maybe she would have called me to say, help me. Because sometimes if we share our story and we share our heart, sometimes that can bring pain and sometimes it can bring joy and most importantly, hope. So I hope by me sharing my story today that it brings a little bit of hope to everyone. Hope that someone else who everyone said that could never happen to you, I wish I can say it would never have happened to me. I remember leaving home in the middle of the night in pajamas with slippers on with only my purse because the car that was in my name that I was paying for was barred from my existence. And I remember having not my wallet with me and calling my mother, who I've never called for help, to come and help me and pick me and my son up because I was afraid he was gonna come down the hill and run us over. That's how frightened I was. And today, I'm not frightened. Today, I'm filled with peace and joy and love and energy, but more importantly, for hope. So please, think about somebody who you think, well, it would be an honor for me to donate $50 in their name. And Susan doesn't know I'm doing this, so I'll probably get a text from her saying, what are you doing? But really, this is from the heart, and this is part of the healing journey, not just for me, but for many, many others, because silence is not an option. So join me in being an advocate and being vocal for those who need us, and we never know who that person could be. So thank you so much. Bring your friends. We have another two hours, a little less than two hours but it's a wonderful Saturday to sit and be there with us and listen to the music that's going to come up. And it's incredible. Maria was incredible. And the artwork, I'm ready to just, it's incredible. And those talented young artists that are showing us how to put our feelings of hope into a vision. And I so appreciate that. So thank you so much. And keep sharing the link and keep chatting away and please join me in honoring someone who you think deserves to be honored and donating in their name and we would appreciate it i know not only me but on behalf of our board members but more importantly on behalf of our community so i love the work that we're doing together 
And thank you for spending Saturday afternoon with me. And so we will continue with our wonderful, wonderful program. I am here with you on this journey. And thank you for being here with me on this journey as well. Like many people, um, I was very familiar with a high, like I come from a high conflict household. So from the time I was a child, um, my dad struggled with bipolar um, schizoaffective disorder, which was untreated for until I was a teenager. So along with that was a lot of um, verbal abusiveness. So I was kind of already conditioned. Um, and then I didn't really have a night. And my mom had this saying, like she got married to stay married. So my dad would come and go, but instead of um, leaving, um, we kind of got stuck in this type of a situation. And hold on one moment. Delilah, please stop. My daughter was making some background noise. I apologize. Um, so then I actually was working in a women's center as a graduate assistant when I was in college because I had brought a friend who had been sexually assaulted there. And while I was working there, found myself in an abusive relationship and I was surrounded by resources everywhere. And I, at that time, didn't uh, feel comfortable to utilize any of them. I was teaching other people how to be in a healthy relationship while kind of living a lie. I liken it to um, being a drug and alcohol counselor and using or something of that nature. Um, it just, I couldn't reconcile it. And, um, and then in fact, I moved across the country to be with that person. And it took a long time, maybe three years to leave that relationship. But I had kind of made a deal with myself. If this shows up again in my life, then I'm going to be strong enough to leave. Um, but I didn't plan that it would come up for me again after I was a mother. So fast forward, um, you know, to, I have an eight-year-old and I have a five-year-old. And when my, once the children came, the relationship that I was in um, were, became pretty difficult. Um, and there was a lot of troubling dynamics. And actually the biggest part came about when it was time to leave. Um, there'd been one big incident where a table got flipped and things were broken and there was a lot of, there'd been kind of the verbal abusiveness part was showing up where we're using, um, you know, loud voices, checking cell phones, calling to see who I'm talking to, um, calling male colleagues and friends saying don't interact with this person. And it just really escalated. And there was this big moment where I said, oh, uh, this has to be the end. Um, this has to be the first day out. Um, so I actually did attempt on that day to leave the relationship, but as many of you know, it's not easy to leave a relationship and people don't always just go away. Um, and it, 
it did take years. And once it was really the leaving the relationship part that really started this big, long struggle for me in terms of um, needing to like feel like being isolated geographically as family was far away. Um, again, still working in a women's that are thinking I should be able to figure this out by myself. I should should be able to do this. It seems seems obvious, um, but it wasn't. Um, and it honestly took an alum who had come to school with me and came back and was talking about the Family Justice Center and helped me circle, like she had talked about the work that they did. And one day it clicked with me that actually I, I was in this type of a situation and I had been for this point by year, for years, um, this constant harassment situation and struggle and being threatened and having um, somebody show up in the middle of the night and getting phone calls all day long at work, um, almost losing my job. And it wasn't until um, somebody pointed out, like, this is the situation you're in and what about the Family Justice Center? So it really took me getting connected with the Family Justice Center to make a long and sustained change. Hey, Terrence and Chris, so nice to see you. Uh, I invited you to speak to me a little bit today because we are celebrating our 10th year anniversary of the Contra Costa Family Justice Center. So for those of us who don't really know you well because you left Contra Costa County just a, <laughs> a while ago, please uh, tell us your connection with Contra Costa County Family Justice Center. How about we start with Chris? Well, my, my connection was uh, being the police chief in Richmond for about 10 years uh, before coming to Tucson, where I'm the police chief now. But um, during that time, uh, I was part of a group that helped uh, set up, develop, create, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, the Family Justice Center. And very, very proud to be part of that effort. Thank you. And Terrence? Uh, well, my role back then was working for, as a chief of staff for supervisor, John Joya. So I was the staff person who helped uh, make that connection between the county uh, and all the different stakeholders, and then and then work to make sure that our the, the building, we were able to get the building for you guys. You know, the building has always been important. We understand that. And now there's more than one facility, which is amazing. But um, I really think it was the combined effort and vision of uh, folks way, way before that even to get, you know, this idea off the ground in the first place. Well, that combined vision, I would say it was the police department, it was law enforcement, it was um, our advocates, it was the county, it was the city. I mean, at the end, I think it was um, Bill Lindsay who really kind of really championed a lot of this at the end too, I mean, with, with, with all of our backings and with uh, Chris's backing. Um, so that was really awesome. I remember from really the very first time a group of us got together to talk about this concept. Um, we were guided by one key, uh, key principle, one key goal, which was to be in service to victims. Uh, victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence. And even as we um, worked very early on to sort of come together and figure out what our work might look like and how we could move forward. And I think the best way to do it was really to consolidate, not to consolidate, but to centralize those services all under one roof so that we weren't um, making survivors of domestic violence go into Central County, go into Martinez to get one thing and then have to, you know, go somewhere else into another part of the county. And, and I remember our conversations around this was a lot of them don't have cars, a lot of them had to take buses, public transportation, and it would take hours, right? And hours uh, for one, for just to get maybe one document um, process to get from West County to Central County. And this was really the, the way to centralize so that everything was in one space. We really wanted to make things as easy as possible, but also to do it in an environment where people felt supported, um, where they could bring their children if necessary, where it was, um, where it would be accessible, people would be kind, there would be a listening ear, the resources would be present. Um, I think that really was the, 
the primary goal. There were so many great people that we worked with, and there was really a spirit of let's figure out how we get things done. Even if it's difficult, even if we run into obstacles, we're not going to give up. And, I'm, and I miss that sort of can-do attitude, but I know it's continuing on, um, even though we're many miles away now in Tucson. We will never um, forget those relationships. I, I have a special place, really, in my heart for all those folks. So my wish is that they just continue doing the great work that they're doing and know that we continue to think about them and appreciate them even, even down here in Tucson, many miles away. I say hi, everybody. Happy 10 year anniversary. And we miss you guys. We love working with you. We miss all of you. We're terrific fans of yours. Um, and if there are people who are watching, thinking about giving uh, to the Family Justice Center, it is an amazing place to uh, give your donation. I've never seen a Family Justice Center, and I've seen a number of them now in different places, um, never seen anything that compares to what, the, what you all have in Contra Costa County. And again, it's because of the people. So we love you, we miss you, and here's to another 10 years ahead. Exactly. Um, I think it's very thoughtful. And thank you, Portia. Your uh, artistic talent is incredible. So please, everyone, take a look at it. And I love how you depict hope. So creative. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. We really want to thank our sponsor, the Contra Costa Regional Health Foundation. We are so thankful for your support and your partnership. And we agree, we look forward to continuing to partnering for another 10 years. So we look forward to our 20th celebration. Thank you again. Hi, my name is uh, Nazari Preciado. I'm a navigator at our East Center in Antioch. Human trafficking impacts many in our community. People can be trafficked and exploited in many forms, including sexual exploitation, labor, begging, crime, and domestic servitude. People don't have to be transported across borders for trafficking to take place. In fact, transporting or moving the victim doesn't define trafficking. It can take place within a single country or even within a single community. Victims need a number of resources such as food, shelter, clothing, an advocate to talk with, and a safety plan. Families of human trafficking victims also need emotional support. Wow, that was powerful. 
We do want to thank our partnership with the Contra Costa Defender Association. They say they're proud to support the Family Justice Center, but we are so proud to partner with you. Thank you again, and we really appreciate it. here, myself, all of us were born with our hair like this, and we just wear it like this, because it's natural, because uh, the reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance is beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? All right. It's like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance is beautiful. My name is Natalie, and I am the center director for our Concord office. Strangulation is one of the best predictors for subsequent homicide of victims of domestic violence. One study showed that the odds of becoming an attempted homicide victim increased by 600%, and the odds of becoming a homicide victim increased by 750%. For women strangled by their partner. In response to the severity of strangulation in domestic violence cases, California passed SB 40 in 2018. SB 40 requires law enforcement responding to a domestic violence incident to include a statement informing the victim that strangulation may cause internal injuries and encouraging the victim to seek medical attention. In January of 2019, Contra Costa created the Strangulation Task Force. This was created in response to the lethal implications of strangulation for domestic violence victims. The task force is a multi-agency team with representatives from domestic violence agencies, law enforcement, and healthcare agencies. The task force's goal is to create a uniform response to how Contra Costa agencies respond to victims of strangulation. The results have been overwhelming. 15 of 26 law enforcement agencies, three of the major healthcare agencies, and two of the domestic violence advocacy centers have been trained on responding to cases of strangulation. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Nazaria and Amaya. You are beautiful. Thank you so much for that inspiration. We also want to thank our, um, our partners, Local 350, 342, my apologies. And we look forward to continuing our partnership. Thank you for your support and being here for the Family Justice Center.
Steve Glazer, um, state senator representing uh, most of Contra Costa County and parts of Alameda County. And it's great to be uh, here in this conversation. You know, I'm asked what got me involved in, in public service. I really go, it goes for me, it goes back to growing up in Sacramento with my family. My mother and my father were both very active in nonprofit work. Um, and um, they were informed and engaged about things happening in our world and had those conversations with the kids around the dinner table. And so it was it always been a part of my life to understand and appreciate the importance of, of service. And uh, of course, has led to uh, eventually later in life uh, running for and being elected to the state Senate. It's easy to uh, identify why I'm a big supporter of the Family Justice Center. Uh, the center provides so many essential services to victims and survivors of domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, human trafficking, elder and child abuse. Uh, this is such important work, um, may, maybe more so than it's ever been. We're under tremendous stress as we try to uh, work through this uh, pandemic. Uh, the Justice Center, uh, led by your wonderful uh, CEO, Susan uh, Kim, has been a critical partner in making sure that we address uh, marginalized communities who have been hit hardest by the impacts of COVID. Uh, and when I think of the people uh, that your organization supports, I know how difficult that work is, and I am committed to doing everything I can to be supportive of your efforts. Your, your mission of bringing together our community to support the healing of family violence survivors is powerful and incredibly uh, meaningful. I thank you all for your good work, and I look forward to working with you to continue the progress that uh, we know we need to continue to make together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I have the honor of thanking two of our favorite sponsors. Not that we have favorites, but when we say that the coffees know everyone, the coffees know everyone. So Angie and Pete, thank you so much for your sponsorship and your support in all things community. And uh, Grassi, did I say it right, Angie and Pete? Let me know if I did or not. If not, in Spanish, gracias. You have done a wonderful job and thank you, thank you for all your support financially and just being there um, for the Family Justice Center and for all of the community. I'm so pleased to work with you. Katie Flokowski. I am a Contra Costa resident for almost my entire life, and that is the primary reason that I support the Family Justice Center, a warm and welcoming place for families impacted by all forms of interpersonal violence. I've also been a prosecutor in Contra Costa County for almost 25 years, and I've learned that as a member of the criminal justice system, we can't do it all alone. We depend on our partnership with the Family Justice Center to help with co-located resources and their navigators connect our survivors to all of the local uh, resources and culturally competent victim-centered support that they need to move out of violence and uh, get back to their lives.
So I was so excited. I sent a contribution to the Family Justice Center and Susan Kim, the Saint Susan, contacted me. And so that's when I came and I visited and I saw the beautiful uh, facility that you have there. And then over the years, you've added more and more. And there's just so much that you do for the community that we love it. So that drew us in just what a wonderful organization you are and how how many people you reach. We're a group of women. There's nine of us now. We're all neighbors. We started out, we think maybe 18 or 20 years ago. We're not sure exactly how long, but two of us thought there were so many incredible women in our area. Why don't we invite one for breakfast every Friday and we'll get to know some, some of our neighbors. So we love doing things like this, you know, finding projects where we can help our community. And that's how we found out. Louise explained what it was and we said, yes. We knew that it was uh, women and a lot of kids who needed a, a kind of a little boost at Christmas. So that was our motivation for helping. I've just been pleased um, over the years about the strides that Richmond has made. And I feel like the Family Justice Center is um, one of the important factors in this. I think that the, the services that are provided are, are, are just incredible. I wish that you would find many, many, many benefactors so that you could have unlimited resources and reach even more families. Mm -hmm. I guess just spread the word because there's so many of us that really want to help. We just yeah. love our community and especially when it comes to women and children. You know, we are absolutely there. For a, a member of the community who's interested in, and looking for what the signs are, if you think someone is being trafficked and what to do and where to go, those classes are fabulous as well. And you've got yoga and all, and the counseling. And I mean, I don't know how much you've been able to do because of COVID in the center itself, but the whole philosophy is is just wonderful. And, I, and what I'd like to see going forward is just more of it. What would the community do if the Richmond Family Center wasn't there? And that's a really important question because it's such a vital, important organization. So that's really just, we're so grateful that you're here to help members of our community who we believe are very, very valuable especially now with COVID and the downturn in the economy. Yeah, we, we yeah. need help more than ever. Yeah, there's there's more family violence and uh, just a lot of negative things, but um, you know, I, I think we can turn them into positives with an organization like yours. Kimberly Walker, and I'm the founder of Karma Yoga Tribe. Karma Yoga Tribe is a community-based uh, yoga uh, collaboration between myself and um, nonprofit organizations in the community. And our goal is to provide, really provide access to yoga for all people. I'm very honored. I, I, I also feel like um, being honored by the Family Justice Center is also uh, because of the great work that, that the Family Justice Center does. It's reach the way that it supports uh, women and families, families period, um, has really just, um, it, inspired, it, it, it keeps me inspired, right? To continue to give and, and um, to, to, you know, give and, and do as much as I can. It's been so easy. It feels like I'm a, like a tangential part of a huge family. And I love, you know, the mission, it, it suits my, like what, what it, my purpose, you know, like what I think my purpose is. And I really feel that my purpose is to be of support to women and children, moms, people who are in transition, leaving spaces that aren't healthy for them, whether it's abuse or just needing to leave the, the you know, the state that they're in and just wanting to be someplace else and needing support. And I have the capacity for that. So I wanted to bring it there and partner with you with what Family Justice Center has been lovely. The second we knew that we would be in quarantine and shut down, Orvon was like, let's do a Zoom class. And I was like, I'm all over it. So how can I make sure that I'm actually contributing to these constituents 
And so I started talking to some yoga teachers. We all want to make stronger connections and we all want to be a more purposeful presence for the community. And our constituents are our, our, our members of people that come to our classes. And I just said, well, you know, would you be willing to teach one class one Monday um, and just bring your people and tell them why we're doing it? Raising money for domestic violence was something that needed to happen after reading that, you know, people in quarantine with in quarantine quarantined with their abusers and what that means, and then learning that Family Justice Center is like creating these like very direct donations to their clients so that their clients can have, figure out safe ways to, uh, to, to support themselves. I just thought, well, this is a no brainer for me. Um, and I, I, I put those two things together. I got my, my colleagues and my yoga colleagues in line and they were all, but I mean, they were so excited to do it. And, um, and we raised, I think we just, we raised $3,000. And we influenced about 2,400 with the matching grant. It was a day in the week where I was connecting with a lot of people around this huge, beautiful cause. And then knowing that it was going, money was going to the Family Justice Center and being utilized 100% directly to support constituents just made me, I felt I was fulfilled. That was so inspiring. I'm so glad to let everyone know that this year, the Family Justice Center created the Partner of Hope Award. It's an individual, this award is an individual or group that believes in the mission of the Family Justice Center and donates their time to supporting our work. This year, we had two winners of the Partner of Hope Awards, the Friday Morning Breakfast Group and Kimberly Walker with Karma Yoga Tribe. They are so inspiring. The Friday Morning Breakfast Group, it was started about 20 years ago by nine neighbors, as they said, to get to know one another in the community. And for the past several years, the Friday Morning Breakfast Club has given toys and gifts for the families at our center during the holidays. And the joy our clients feel when they get a toy of their own is the best gift ever. We want to thank the Friday Morning Breakfast Club for their support for all these years. Kimberly Walker created the Karma Yoga Tribe. As she said, it's a community-based yoga collective focused on healing and wellness. Kimberly has partnered with our West Center for years now to provide weekly yoga sessions to our partners and clients. She believes wholeheartedly in the healing and restorative nature of yoga. And we want to thank Kimberly for her dedication to providing yoga at our center. Now, as I always do, I have a couple of things for you. One. Send the note out for the next hour to be with us. Call your family and friends and tell them they're going to witness and be part of something great. Two, remember, any donation is great. A dollar, five dollars, fifty dollars. Remember our fund a need, which I'll get back to later. And three, the Breakfast Club and Kimberly are inspiring. They took what they had whether it was a collective, whether it was breakfast, whether it was just nine people, and look at the impact that they made. So what can you do? If you can't give money, can you give time? Can you create your own breakfast club or lunch club or book club or reading club or art club, maybe an art and wine club with nine people to begin to do that? And Kimberly, my hat is off to you. I would love to do yoga and I will try yoga again if you promise me that you'll come and untangle me because usually I can't get out of whatever pose you get into. But for the Family Justice Center, I will commit to it. So what will you commit to? What can you do to change the lives of those around you? Thank you. Wow. Isn't this just what we were talking about? Happiness, joy, hope, resilience, beautiful. 
renew, renewable hope is ambition. I am so moved by this. In fact, I would love to have this piece of art. This is incredible. Thank you for putting this into this depiction for all of us. Hope, love, resilience. What more could we ask for? Thank you, Tanisha. You are such an artist and you are so talented. And thank you for sharing your talent. Okay, well, my eyes are a little older than that. So I, if I could ask for it to be made a little bigger. So hope, I still can't see. <laughs> hope pokes dry beans from shelf into a tomato can full of dirt. This is by Edith Friedman. Hope reminds the kids to pick up a pencil when the TV is TV remote is equally close. Is there, is hope there when he asks, when he calls? In the morning, there's nobody here by that name. Check back later. Hope rides the bus to school, to work. She could use a bus pass. Hope notes the enthusiasm of weeds and more of the, I can't see that word. The more than many of us thought. Hope makes noise in the quiet, a brass band with precautions and yet dancing in the street. Hope runs with the people, outraged and still protecting us. Hope tugs with the parents pulling wagons with their dazed or joyous or sleeping children inside. Maybe this time, I asked her, above her mask, her eyebrows lifted, not saying no. With her cousins, she puts her shoulder to the anchored objects. She stands behind the masked man in the White House. Hope signs his speeches in ASL so more people understand them. Hope encircles the women who would legislate guns into shining heaps of dust. Hope flows through the pen. Where on the green end paper Tilly Olson wrote, these things shall be, and sign her name in tiny script. Hope sees how a gang of elk ambling over Highway 101 makes the highway invisible. Hope moves in the Zoom class when a plane buzzes over and people in three cities and two countries look up as if the sky were one. Hope travels with the woman who carries pizza, Spanish wine, and strong opinions to our backyard. Hope lives inside her work. Hope collects her friend at the curb. The number of people who found on healing set me, says the friend, how can I pass that on? Hope walks through the stained glass door and sits quietly in the waiting room. The skin that holds her eye is purple again. She flinches before standing. We bring her some water, help her fill out the form, and she tells us what she needs. Thank you for bringing this forward. And that is hope. And we are hopeful that you will be here with us as we go down this journey. Thank you. Uh oh, the fun to need. Here it is. We are hoping that you have been inspired to look at what your dollars can do for our community. And I'm going to give you some ideas, as I did earlier. But remember, the challenge is, what can you do to bring hope to people? Hope, like my cousin. Hope for someone like me, who no one ever thought it would happen to. How can you bring a voice to people? There are different ways you can do it. Right now, I'll tell you about the, the different options we have. And then we'll talk a little bit more about other things that you can do that the breakfast club gave us ideas and Kimberly and her yoga tribe. So fund a need at $2,500 allows us to support 20 clients in our wings program. 
And it allows the, the, our navigator to connect the clients to education and workforce development to remove and help with all barriers so that they can get employment and a job. And they can do something that they love and feel productive and empowered. And that's what hope is. So if you have $2,500 and you want to do that for 20 clients, I think it might be worth it. If you can't do $2,500, what about $1,000? $1,000 is to support 10 children in receiving trauma-informed academic support in the Success Academy program. 10 children and trauma-informed academic support. So while this violence is happening in secret, in silence, behind closed doors, there are children who are watching and who are experiencing this trauma. So it's our job as a community to come together and to provide them with hope. So please think about if you can do this. If you can't, and I understand, what about $500? It allows us to continue our Project Connect program. It's a survivor-led community building circle. It's a circle of hope. Can you do that? Half a circle, that's an arc. It's still very, very much needed. And these monthly gatherings, they're in Zoom right now. And hopefully soon, we'll be able to bring everyone together in person, socially distanced, of course. And we've provided much support and empowerment for survivors and a strong sense of community. And remember, today I've shared with you that silence kills. It killed my cousin. And it almost killed me and my son. Silence is no longer an option. So please feel free to think about how you can bring hope. If you can't do it in that way, how about $100? Provides a backpack. And it was organized by a former community fellow, Cynthia Altamarino. Thank you, Cynthia. And that's how she brings it forward. Maybe she didn't have $100, but she had time and a heart and passion and commitment. And now all of these children are benefiting. So remember, if you can do $100, that's great. If you can do $100 and start up an evening book club, that would be great. We really need your help. And we need you to help provide hope. Hope is really hard. And these young artists have depicted it so well. It's painful, it's a journey, and we need you. I need you. And I was very lucky that I had people here. They were my circle. It would be great if you can be people's circle. So thank you so much. And we are so lucky. We have great sponsors. We talked about them. You've seen videos, you've seen slides. But I want to send just a personal thank you to all listed. Marathon, thank you to Marathon. They gave and they gave with their heart. The Contra Costa Regional Health Foundation, thank you, Betty and team. We really appreciate it. Close to my heart, and I'm representing John Muir Health. Healthcare has gone through so much this last year, and they, to me, our healthcare heroes. So thank you. The Sino Foundation, the Sino Homes. Thank you, Jackie. We miss you so much, but we are so glad that you continue to be part of our foundation. And the last one, I can't see because I am over 21 and don't have my reading glasses on. So all of you can laugh at me and laugh with me. Um, healing Circle. And Mechanics Bank, so uh, Union 342, that would be great. Safety Circle, Software Simplified, the Rotary Club. We really want to thank all of our Rotary members and Rotary Club. Chevron, Bridge Bank, 
Kaiser Diablo, Kaiser East Bay, and just in general, Kaiser Permanente. Angie and Pete Coffey, thank you. And Elizabeth Permezzi, thank you, Elizabeth, for your support and for being a wonderful board member, as well as you, Angie. I, uh, you made it smaller, so now I really can't read it. But friends, um, you'll have to make it. Let me see. Kathleen, thank you. The Contra Costa Defender Association, thank you. Dana Filikowski, she is awesome. She is wonderful. And she rides bikes at an incredible speed. She is my hero. <laughs> Bonnie and Merrill Hall and Garaventa Enterprises. So I hope I was able to capture everyone and thank you so much. Okay, now this is Hope, a young girl with a smile and a sofa. That is incredible because as you know, a lot of our families have housing insecurities. And I love this smile. And I love her hearts. And I love her brown skin. I love how she embraces who she is. And I wish when I was her age, I could have done that. Thank you, Emily. We really appreciate it. And she's only five. I can't wait to see her art when she's 20. That is incredible. Thank you all. I'll be back on at four o'clock and we'll have more to come. Please, as I said, this is your challenge now. I put this out to you. Get your friends on. We have music. We have more art. We have surprises. And really, we just want to share the rest of the hour with all of you to finish this journey together. And you bring me hope. And thank you for being here. And please join me for the last hour and bring hope to those who need it the most. Thank you. Hello, I'm Pat Rickey. On behalf of myself and our team here at Blackhawk Media, we would like to present this performance to bring attention to the great work done by the Family Justice Center. The Family Justice Center helps families, spouses, children, or elders suffering from interpersonal abuse. Family Justice Center is unique because they provide essential consolidated help all under one roof. Their great work relies on your support. Please visit cocofamilyjustice.org for more information and to donate. And now I'd like to share with you my original composition inspired by the Family Justice Center and the families they serve.
so much. Um, I actually am on a little earlier, but I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm here to tell you something. So what I was talking about in terms of donating your time, we actually had someone step up. I am so happy to say that someone very close to my heart, Ms. Florence Davis, who worked for many, many years in um, the family justice organizations as well as with um, the uh, violence prevention world. I really wanna say thank you, Florence. She is donating her time and her expertise to not only do a belonging circle in coordination with the Family Justice Center, she has offered to train facilitators on how to conduct the family, the, the circles. That is a donation from the heart. And we are so grateful. So all of you out there, can you think of something? Can you get together with a book club? and say, we want to donate books to the, the children of the Family Justice Center. If you want to learn how to do a belonging circle, will you consider volunteering? And that way, Florence has people that are interested in learning how to do a belonging circle. And she's a, she's a master at it. You would be learning from the best. So that is what I'm talking about. Be creative in your journey to help those who need hope. And just so all of you know, I have shared so personally, and it was so difficult, but it has been so empowering. And one person that was always there every day during that time was Florence. Thank you, Florence. She's a great inspiration, a great advocate, and she has the ability to see good in everyone. And that would make, to learn from her about how to conduct a, a belonging circle is incredible. I might even take her up on that. Although I'm looking for you to think about what you can do and how maybe you can put your energies toward helping those who need help. And remember, it's been a long year. Children were not going to school. Teachers couldn't see if there was bruises or the lack of food or neglect. It was a very difficult year. And how can we help those students? How can we help those who were in their abusive situation 24-7? I urge you and I plead with you. Think about what you can do creatively. A breakfast club? I think Louise had the right idea. Thank you, Louise. Florence has the right idea. Kimberly has the right idea. If you have a talent that you think could get people together to honor our most needy, that would be great. Because not only are they suffering from abuse, these children are hungry. These families are scared a toy to someone who normally would not get a toy is in a very, very important experience. Something stable that they can hold on to. A backpack. Things that they normally wouldn't get. So it doesn't have to be Christmas in order to give. So I am so proud. Thank you, Florence, for stepping up to the call to action, to be able to provide a belonging circle. For those of you who want to learn how to run one, please reach out to us. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have you help us in this very difficult journey. And I am still looking for you to all think about someone that you'd like to donate in honor of. Someone who has moved your heart or who you think is in trouble. It's okay. It's okay to be afraid. But remember what we said earlier. Silence is no longer an option. It's not an option. And it will save someone's life. I guarantee that. And I say that from someone who has lost someone. And I say that as someone who was threatened to be killed. 
and who was threat, there was also a threat to my own child. So please think about what you can do. You all bring me hope. Let's get our families on for the last hour. Let's get us together because this is a circle. This is a belonging circle right now. And I'm so honored to be here with you. Thank you.
happy 10th anniversary, Family Justice Center. That got my heart pumping, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you. I have some great news. So I want to tell you and do just do a quick shout out for those of you who have um, stepped to the call of action. Lori Johnson, thank you so much. Lisa Delano, thank you. We've received your payment as well as from you, Lori. Tamina, thank you, Tamina, for always being a champion. Dana Falowski, thank you so much, Dana. Your support and your energy is wonderful. Tamina, Anne-Marie Taylor, thank you, Anne-Marie. Carolyn O'Bringer, thank you, Carolyn, for always being such a supportive person to Family Justice Center. Sue Sisters, LLC, thank you so much. We've received your, your donation. Ann Lackey, thank you so much. Alfred Bree Stansberry. Bisa French, thank you, Bisa. Ken Carlson, thank you, Ken. And Thomas Sino, thank you, Tom. We so appreciate it. We've also received some pledges from Louise Williams, Kay Tittle, Peter, and Harry Gilbert. Thank you, we've received your pledges. And I don't wanna forget, Florence Davis has donated her time to providing belonging circles and facilitating, or maybe it's an or, but we'll put and or, facilitate uh, training facilitators on doing the belonging circle. So if I didn't call your name and I missed you, please let me know. We're gonna make this bigger because I don't have my glasses. And we are at 90,600. We have a little under 10,000 to go. Do you think that we can do that in this last hour? Do you think that we can do that to bring hope to some of these families, these children? And if you can, it could be over time. It doesn't all have to be today. But we really, really would love to, to hit our goal in order to help the most vulnerable. One of the most vulnerable communities, it's silent. Remember, it can happen to anyone. It, our children are affected by this in ways that we won't even see for years to come. So let's come together. Let's help them. I said at the beginning of the hour where I shared with all of you that my cousin was killed as part of a domestic violence. She was in silence. She hid it from everyone. And she died at 46. Her children still mourn her. And little did we know that the reason she was silent is that there was a threat against her daughter. My heart still breaks. She was too young. And all she had to do was call and tell me, Stephanie, I need help. And maybe what I should have done is call her and say, I too have gone through this. I too ran from my home. I too am going to lose everything. But I didn't lose my life. And for that, I'm grateful. So share, me, share with me today that silence is no longer an option and we're not gonna be silent. We're gonna be advocates and we're gonna be together on this journey. That's what I shared earlier. So the, for those of you who just joined, I wanted to share that story again to let you know that this can happen to anyone, anywhere, even people that you think would never ever be in this situation. So join me in creating a circle. I feel today we are in a circle. I feel this circle right now of belonging. And again, thank you, Florence, for stepping forward. And thank you for all the pledges, Louise, Kay, Peter, and Harry. And thank you to all of you who just who donated. We do appreciate it. And to all of our sponsors for supporting us and for wanting to continue this journey with us. I do wanna also tell you that we, we did have a new um, Partner of Hope Award, and we mentioned this earlier, but I have to say this was so inspiring. So it really is 
an, an individual or a group that believes in the mission of the Family Justice Center and donates their time to supporting the work. So there were two winners this year. They were both so good, we couldn't choose among them. The Partner of Hope Awards went to the Friday morning group breakfast group and Kimberly Walker with the Karma Yoga Tribe. And just think, the Friday morning breakfast group was just someone who said, I want to get to know my neighbors. And nine of them started to have breakfast every Friday. And they came together. And for the past several years, this group, they gave toys and gifts for the families at the Family Justice Center. We all have breakfast. We all have lunch. We all have dinner. We all have walking groups, running groups, or people we just get together with, or book clubs. Why not give books to the, the children? Why not get gifts to the children? Kimberly Walker, when she created the Karma Yoga Tribe, and again, I told you, I am so impressed because when I try to do yoga, I probably am the worst yoga person there, but I try. And she got a community-based yoga collective focused on healing and wellness. And she partnered with the West Center for many years. And she provides weekly yoga sessions to the partners and the clients. Otherwise, they may not have the opportunity for this type of mindfulness and time for their physical and mental wellness. And we want to thank Kimberly for donating and creating and using her talents to touch those in our circle. I also have a surprise. I want to be here to tell all of you that there were winners in the art contest. Now, that being said, everyone was a winner. Everyone today was a winner. And you've been seeing their beautiful artwork. There were a few that particularly stood out and I'd love to announce the names. So the first one was for her painting, The Child of Yun Yun. And Yun Yun TC is the winner. So thank you, Yun Yun. You did a great job. Michaela Rink for her poem, Hope Poem. Remember that powerful poem about how everything at the end was about the person with the bruise? That no matter what, they still had a bruise, but they had hope. Andrea Bandajas for her video Esperanza. Portia Payton for her painting, I Am Hope. Remember that beautiful, beautiful piece of art. And Riley Bartlett for her poem, Showcasing Hope. Congratulations to all of our amazing artists. The Family Justice Center staff will be in touch with the winners to coordinate getting you your awards. We are so happy for you. So this is our last hour together to get in those donations. So I'm going to go through the, the fund a need one more time just so that you can remember it. And again, I'm also going to challenge all of you. Bring your friends, your family on board for the last 45 minutes so they can join us in this. Think creatively about something that you can give of yourself. Create a dinner club, a book club, and see what you can do collectively. I know time is very difficult, but we can do this. So for $2,500, it will allow us to support 20 clients in the WINGS program. And the navigator will co connect with those clients, help them with their education and workforce development programs to help them become independent and to remove all barriers to employment. $2,500. $2,500 will help someone not just get out of the situation they're in, but to be sustainable and live with hope and joy. If you can't do $2,500, let's try 1000 And for 1000 you can support 10 children receiving trauma-informed support for a whole year in the Su Success Academy program. These are kids that have seen things that we, no one should see. 
And these are kids that have experienced trauma. And this is going to give them a chance to do well, to get through that trauma and to go on a good road academically. And that's what we want. I understand if you can't do that. Maybe $500 is a little bit easier for you. It'll allow us to continue our Project Connect program. It's a survivor-led community building circle. Now, that's really important, and I want to stop and just pause. Survivor-led. That means that someone who has gone through what someone else is going through engages them and shows them that it can be done. That is powerful, powerful. Right now, they're happening through Zoom. But hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to have them in our centers. And it brings them a sense of not just community, but hope. And remember, it breaks that silence. Because that's what people want, is for people to live in silence about their trauma. And we are going to break that. So if you can do the 500, yeah, we would appreciate it. And if you, I understand if you can't. And if you can't, think about $100. $100 to help provide backpacks for our, our children. And these are the same children that are having a lot of difficulty because they're watching verbal mental abuse occurring, or they are, unfortunately, the victims of that. So the donations will be filled. Your donation, it'll help us fill the backpacks. If you can't do the 100, do the 90, do the 80, do 50, even if you do five. That is so much appreciated. If you can't do any money today, that's okay. But if you have a talent you'd like to share, we love volunteers and we want to have you in our circle. So think about it. So please, another 45 minutes, call a friend, share the link. We'd love to have you. If you ever have questions, Send us a note, a chat, and we're here for you. And remember, silence is no longer an option. We are going to be a strong circle, and we are. Thank you. So our bodies have an inherent capacity to heal if we give them them the opportunity to. Esta canción se llama Cura. Y es para nuestras aguas internas, nuestra luz interna, nuestros arcoíris en nuestras células. Agüita, agüita, Ayúdame a curar Agüita, agüita, amada amiga Ayúdame a curar Cuerpo de luz, cuerpo de arco iris Que cura, que cura Que cura, que cura, que cura, que cura, 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 cura. Plantita, plantita amada amiga. Ayúdame a curar Plantita, plantita, amada amiga 
This next song is about inner alchemy, and um, I learned a lot about inner alchemy as a traditional medicine practitioner. Like I said, uh, the body has an incredible capacity to heal, and uh, the more that we let it, and the more we have safe spaces to to unwind. So please uh, donate to Family Justice Center so that they can keep doing the good work they're doing. And this song is called Alquimia.
inventarme una leyenda Una razón heroica para estar así Para bailar, que se para bailar. Yo quiero decirte algo. Tengo frío, un glacial vive. Esto es lo que yo te pido Yo quiero que me mires derritiéndome Yo quiero que me mires derritiéndome Yo quiero que me mires derritiéndome Yo quiero que brazos abiertos y el corazón en la mano con los brazos abiertos y el corazón en la mano con los brazos brazos abiertos y el corazón en la mano y el corazón en la mano y el corazón en la mano y el corazón how important it is to be in right relationship with the earth i think we're learning that now as a species <laughs> globally how important it is to be in right relationship with the earth to take care of it <laughs> song is about that and about resisting systems of oppression and exploitation capitalism colonization and all that song is inspired in the Puerto Rican struggle, but it's a song for everybody. Tan frágil el reflejo en el cristal. Efímero como la luz baila en el mar 
la marea canta siempre su canción alucinante cuando se pone el sol esotérica tropical esotérica tropical esotérica tropical esotérica tropical las olas vienen y se van besos mojados Soy sirena, soy el sol y soy el mar Y mi alimento es sonidos Encantar Esotérica tropical Esotérica tropical Fresca mi alma, el agua refresca mi alma, el agua refresca mi alma, el agua, el agua refresca mi alma, el agua refresca mi alma, el agua refresca mi alma, en la fuerza natural. Que te invita a luchar por nuestro país, por nuestra tierra, por nuestro futuro, por lo que vendrá. Y es que el Caribe te da mucha magia, mucha fuerza. Mucha magia, mucha fuerza, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha fuerza, mucha magia, mucha fuerza, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha magia, mucha magia. Mucha magia, mucha fuerza. Yo estoy ready para la lucha. Yo soy la naturaleza. Soy caribeña, latinoamericana. Y a mí me habla el corazón del agua. Lleva ya, yo te escucho y en Maya. Hasta ve, yo te escucho, madre tierra. Tú la tires mi palpitar. Defenderte mi promesa, esta tierra se respeta, mucha magia, mucha fuerza. Yo estoy ready para la lucha, yo soy la naturaleza. Soy caribeña, latinoamericana, y a mí me habla el corazón del agua y en Maya. Yo te escucho y en Maya, hasta vez yo te escucho, madre tierra. Tú la tires mi palpitar. Defendete mi promesa, esta tierra se respeta. Corazón de la tierra, corazón de la Corazón de la tierra, corazón del agua, corazón de la tierra, corazón del agua, corazón.
corazón de la tierra, corazón del agua. El agua fluye como la sangre en las venas, nube cargada de llanto, aguacero, el cuerpo un río, un océano. Nuestra vida es la tierra, nuestra vida es el agua, vamos a defenderla. So this last song is uh, my first very outwardly political song. Um, I'm a healer and I write songs about healing, but With life, I learned that healing is political, and my journey is a journey of decolonization from within, in connection to others, hopefully in connection to you. So this song is about overthrowing <laughs> uh, oppressive systems that don't work. So you can, you can identify the systems that don't work for you. And, and I hope you enjoy it. It's called Huracán. Este gobierno no sirve, no queremos dictadura, que se quieren quedar con todo y no nos vamos a dejar, y no nos vamos a dejar, nosotros vamos a luchar, nosotros vamos a luchar, nosotros vamos a luchar. Sopla la junta para el carajo, llévatelo. horizontal estado de
Thank you. I want to thank uh, Family Justice Center, and I want to thank everybody involved in the production of this video. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sonia Johnson. I've been a domestic violence advocate and volunteer for 10 years now. And one of the questions that has come up often is, why doesn't she just leave? Seems like a simple enough question. For my mom, it was not that easy. Um, English was her second language. She had three small kids. She was 3,000 miles away from family and friends. Her only friends were his. Um, the unfortunate part is that we had neighbors, we had friends that knew what was going on. Um, people would see her face, people would hear the screams. We lived in San Francisco in a, in a small apartment. And if you're familiar with the city, you know that apartments are stacked up on top and next to each other. And no one ever said anything, no one ever tried to help. And as a kid growing up in that environment, that was very difficult for me. So the reason that I've been an advocate and a volunteer is because I always just strive to be the person I wish had walked alongside my mother and um, my brothers and myself in that time of our lives. Um, the Family Justice Center is very important to me. I, I appreciate and have a huge respect for what they do because they're making it, they're making a very difficult situation as easy as possible for the victim. In the middle of a traumatic situation, it's hard for the victim to remember everything that's, all the information that's being given to them. But the Family Justice Center walks alongside, they advocate for them, they, they give them all of the resources they need, um, not just to get out of that situation in that moment, but to stop the cycle with the next generation of children. So I just wanted to say thank you to the Family Justice Center for doing all of the wonderful work that you do, um, having a one-stop shop where a victim of domestic violence can go and have everything taken care of is, is a huge blessing and a huge benefit. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Wasn't that incredible? Um, Maria, that music was from the heart and there was chats going on about how people didn't know the language, but they could feel it. So thank you. So um, I just wanted to let everyone know we have one more sponsor we wanted to thank, uh, the Garaventa Enterprises. Thank you for always supporting us and thank you for the sponsorship as well as all of your support of all the work that we do. It was so much appreciated and we are so grateful. Thank you. Well, we really want to thank you. It's been such a day. Um, we do want to show the uh, winners of our, our art projects and um, so that you can identify them because like me, you probably um, have forgotten what the, who they were and what they are. So this is um, Hope. And um, this is Portia Payton's painting, uh, I Am Hope. It's beautiful, Portia, and thank you and congratulations. You did a wonderful job. And that is an incredible, incredible depiction of hope. The next art contest winner is Yun Yun Tsai. Thank you, Yun Yun Tsai. Uh, and this, her painting is called Child of Union. And it's beautifully done. Thank you so much. Um, it is, it's incredible. And it's one of those artworks that has a lot to it um, that you can sit and look at and feel for a while. So thank you and congratulations. The next winner is Michaela Rink, and it's her poem, What Hope Means to Me. 
beautiful, beautiful poem. Um, thank you for sharing and thank you for um, putting into words what others of us may not be able to. And you did it so beautifully. Thank you, Michaela, and congratulations. The other um, winner is a Showcasing Home. It's by uh, Riley Bartlett. And thank you again for putting into words what can be difficult for a lot of people. But I really appreciate how you talked about hope and made us feel hope. So thank you. Esperanza. La esperanza para mí eres tú, mi querido y adorado hijo, que me enseña cada día a vivir lo no vivido, que me da su sonrisa dando a mi vida sentido, que me impulsa el mañana aunque el hoy no lo hayamos comprendido. Como agua en el desierto eres tú, mi pequeño niño, que calmas mi sed cada día sin que te lo haya pedido, y le doy gracias a Dios porque ya lo he entendido que eres la luz de mis noches y el calor en tiempos de frío. La esperanza me alimenta, mi bello y hermoso hijo, me nutre cada día con su suave y fuerte hilo, me dice en secreto que no habrá que vivir en vilo, que el mañana existe y que podremos celebrar estar vivos. Esperanza que en el mañana te veré con amigos, tal vez en los brazos de una novia, tal vez de la mano con tus hijos. Esperanza de verte hombre, un hombre fuerte y aguerrido, que lucha por lo justo y ayuda al desvalido. Hoy por ti tengo esperanza de todo, mi preciado y amado hijo. Esperanza del silencio que rehuye del sonido. Esperanza de las almas que nos han dejado, que se han ido. Esperanza de esto y aquello, de la pausa y del ruido. Esperanza que el dolor, el miedo y lo sufrido sean apenas un recuerdo presentando lo aprendido. Hoy más que nunca deseo que después de lo que hemos vivido se vaya la oscuridad y la luz aclare nuestro camino, que se unan los pueblos que no se han comprendido, que se acaben las guerras para vivir más unidos. Por fin desaparezcan los odios y nos abracemos entre amigos y cantemos todos de alegría, agradecidos por estar vivos. Thank you so much. Andrea, uh, thank you, Andrea, for such a beautiful, beautiful job. And for those of you who, um, I'm just going to share one thing. Um, esperanza is, in, is the Spanish word for hope. So this day has been such an incredible day. It's been filled with music and art, community, inspiration. And it's been filled with esperanza. It's been filled with hope. So we really want to thank you. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. There's a, a, a healing that I did not expect by sharing the stories that I shared. And I feel it. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate each and every one of you. We are still taking donations. And again, It really is what you you can provide. But think about the talents that you can provide. There are many, many who are there who need it. And like Sonia said, what really hurt is when people knew that something was wrong and no one stepped in and no one asked. So thank you for being there. Thank you for being part of our circle today. Feel free to click on the link. Feel free to chat. Feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Remember today, if you don't remember anything else, that esperanza means hope. And we appreciate you being our hope partners in our hope circle. So on behalf of the Family Justice Board and staff, we want to thank you all for being a part of this community event. And as board members, we are also proud of the work the Family Justice Center does and the staff all the work that they do for all of our families impacted by interpersonal violence on a daily basis in our community. With your support, I believe we can make an impact. And I know we have made an impact and at least one person today. So I hope we re can reduce this increase of violence in Contra Costa County. And we appreciate you so very much. 
I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person next year. And thank you. And remember, esperanza means hope. Thank you.